So we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto awakens the Kuribarigan, Black Rose Eye, Bloodline. A bloodline that caused Third Shinobi War. Here is a quick summary. The manipulation and creation of invisible blades, after an attack from villagers, Naruto awakens his bloodline. From blue, to red, to black, what would Naruto do with his newfound power? But before we start, if you want more stuff like this. Then be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. The night was cold, and the stars glinted brightly against a dark sky. The full moon was tinted a blood red, and the light shone dimly onto a large forest. Animals huddled together for warmth, their breathes ragged and visible as a mist in the air. The trees themselves were silent, and only the slight stir of the wind through the leaves could be heard in that forest. But deep in the middle of the stands of trees was a village. It was an uncommonly large village, and their lights shone brightly in the darkness of the night. Their laughter and cries of joy was so alarmingly different from the rest of the world because there was a festival. A celebration. And everybody could feel the excitement in the air as they danced and laughed and played and sung. As the little kids bought tiny trinkets and ate hand-spun cotton candy. As the adults laughed together and toasted to a great night. The world was asleep, but the people didn't care. Because it was a festival. They were finally free. Was it so wrong to celebrate that? And so, they continued with their happiness, oblivious to the coldness of the rest of the world. But there was one man, so different from the rest. He wore a dark reddish-black cloak, the hood completely hiding his face. He bowed his head low to the ground as he walked down the laughter-filled street. Away from the Hokage Mountain, which he had just left. And this man, so different from the rest, avoided the people and went to the reality of the world. He found himself at the gates of Konoha and just stood there, alone, away from the laughter, away from light and consumed by the silence. And without a backwards glance, the man left the light and turned to the reality of the world. He walked with quick and sure steps as he entered into the trees and his figure was soon disappearing into the darkness. The night was cold and stars glinted brightly against a dark sky. But only one person in the entire world could feel it. It was morning in Kanoha as the light of the sun finally broke through the horizon and into the clear light blue sky of the morning. A small figure walked through the deserted street. This figure had strikingly dark raven hair that stuck up in the back. He didn't pay attention to the discarded litter on the ground or the festival lanterns, still swinging high on the rooftops. His dark eyes eyes, partially hidden by his long bangs, had its eye on one thing alone. The lone, dreary apartment that stuck up against a calm and bright background. But when he came closer, he realized that something was wrong. The apartment felt abandoned and his steps became quicker and more desperate. To the figure's shock, he could smell the disgusting odor of alcohol and explosive powder in the air, and he began running through the stairs. When he reached his destination, he slammed open the door and froze. The apartment was filled with mangled corpses lying everywhere. Their heads were completely missing. No, their heads weren't sliced cleanly off, it was more like as if somebody stuffed a grenade in their mouths and detonated it, judging by the amount of blood splattered against the walls. The figure stepped numbly into the apartment when his foot suddenly broke through the wooden flooring. He hastily withdrew his foot and found, to his surprise, that it was a loose floorboard and inside was a single black book. The figure curiously took out the small book and with trembling hands, opened it and began reading. The whatever curious reader that finds this. In this book is my life, with all the details and thoughts that I could think of. I left this behind so that people might, one day, understand why exactly I did what I did. Why I acted like I was acting. If this is Sasuke that picked up this book, then, team, I have one thing to say to you. Get over that emo crap and start living your life for Kami's sake. Sasuke, for that was the figure's name, stared at the familiar writing, before looking at the bottom of the page, where another sentence, written suspiciously in what looked like blood, was scrawled on. The words itself were written in a different penmanship. Look up at you. Sasuke quickly glanced upwards and felt his eyes widen as he saw the tens of thousands of explosive paper notes stuck to the ceiling, their ends burning rapidly and triggered by a long wire that, to Sasuke's horror, was attached to the book itself. A long way away, at a large red tower almost underneath a massive cliff, the Hokage jumped in shock as he felt a large tremor coming from Naruto's apartment. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? I guess when that sign fell, that's when things started. I could never resist my stupid hero complex. It just felt natural, I guess. Even now, years later, I still have such a noble head and won't refuse any kind of call for help. It's one of the only things, really, that I share with my dope persona. You might be thinking, what am I talking about? What dope persona? I'm not the stupid dead last you've always known. I'm not loud, I'm not obnoxious, I'm not like anything you've always thought of me. The mask was a shield, and yet, as Kano said, it attracted people. It was one of my hidden abilities, people naturally flocked to me. 
Well, once they got over the oversized rabbit living in my head. But why a mask? What the hell would make me need one in the first place? To truly understand, you would have to be Gara, the one-tailed Tanuki, from Suna. You would have to be Yujito, the two-tailed demon cat, from Kumo. You would have to be me, the nine-tailed Kaiubi no Kitsune. We are Jinchuriki, a human sacrifice. We are powerful. We are cursed. We are feared. And you'll never understand that. I used to be confused by all these events. But at seven years old, this was the age of acceptance, when I finally decided to accept everything that would happen to me. I guess that's why I could get over things quickly. But there are still some things I'll always deny. Naruto, a small seven-year-old boy was running clumsily down the alley, his dirty sandals stepping over large puddles, the splashes numbing his feet to the bone. Heavy raindrops drilled onto his normally spiky blonde hair, the ends weighed down with water, dripping from his bangs into his eyes. Those large brilliant blue eyes darted from side to side, searching endlessly for a shortcut, a pathway, anything to get them off his trial. He was being tailed. It was a normal occurrence for him, but this time, he might not be able to get away. Since they happened a lot, he used to have a bodyguard, he called him Idiot Sam because he, to put it bluntly, really sucked at his job. The boy suspected that he was doing it on purpose and learned never to depend on him. Usually, he was able to hide until they left, but now there were Chunin and Jounin following him too. All of his tactics and hiding spots were quickly discovered and there was only one place left to go to. The Hokage Tower. Would he make it? Naruto, for that was the boy's name, ran faster, spurred on by desperation. Suddenly, he slipped on the slick muddy grass, falling heavily onto the ground. He lay there, his breath ragged, thinking of what happened to let up to this. It just didn't make sense. Flashback, Naruto was walking down the road, his gamachan in his pocket. Whispers followed him, as even now he was drawing in attention. The large, slightly fat man purposely shoved into his shoulder, the force knocking him to the ground. Watch it, brat. He growled. Naruto plastered a huge grin on his face, which only seemed to annoy him further. Sorry, sorry, Naruto piped up, with politeness. I wasn't watching where I was going. The conversation seemed to attract people, who kept shooting glances at the pair. The man gave him one last dark look, before stomping past him, managing to step painfully on his foot on the way. Naruto kept smiling at him, seemingly not bothered in the least by the pain. Suddenly, two small blurs bumped into him, and they all crashed into the ground. Bemused, Naruto rubbed his head gingerly before looking at the person, no, two kids, in front of him. They were only around four years old and were wearing bright red beanie hats over their brown hair. They scowled at him for interrupting what was probably a game of tag before running off again. Rolling his eyes at their rudeness, Naruto picked himself off the ground before walking off. They ah. Eyes widening, Naruto snapped his head towards the scream, his smile immediately disappearing. Above the Kanoha bookstore, an enormous wooden sign bearing the words, Blue Serene had broken off from the rooftop, falling at a breakneck speed towards the two kids he had bumped into. The villagers around him, mostly only the elderly and kids, screamed warnings at them, who were too engrossed in their game to pay attention. The world seemed to go in slow motion as Naruto raced over there. His hero complexion took in the facts. 1. There were no ninja around the marketplace in the mornings, meaning no one else was going to save them. And 2. With only small stubby legs, he wasn't going to make it in time. Naruto stubbornly denied the facts, he had to save them. Blue eyes stared desperately at the falling sign. Why couldn't it just go away? Pushing aside shocked people, he screamed. Stew up. The sign disappeared in a swirl of black threads before Naruto fell into unconsciousness. I think he's waking up. Naruto groaned. Why was he feeling a pounding headache? He reluctantly opened bleary eyes, staring up at a nearby blurry object obscuring most of his vision. Slowly, his vision cleared, revealing the worried face of the sandame. The sandam shooed away the nurse before turning back to Naruto. Naruto. How are you feeling? The Hokage asked in a worried tone. Naruto blinked before glancing at the surroundings. He was in fluffy white bed and the room smelt of antiseptic. He was in a hospital. Naruto turned back to the sandame. Ow, he piped up bluntly. He was rewarded when Siratobi chuckled, his face visibly relaxing. Do you remember what happened, Naruto? He asked. Naruto shook his head, immediately regretting it as it sent new waves of pain into his head. Seeing Naruto's grimace, Siratobi continued in a gentler tone. You suddenly collapsed in the middle of the street, the doctor said it was severe chakra exhaustion he continued in a more serious tone. Do you know why? Chakra? Naruto asked slowly in confusion. It's the energy source of our bodies, Siratobi explained. Naruto nodded his head, slowly this time, in understanding. Slowly, the memories came back to him. The sign. What exactly happened? His mind raced over the possibilities, although none of them made much sense. He glanced up to see Saratobi's expected face and realized he was supposed to say something. Are the little people okay? 
Naruto asked suddenly, waving his arms in a panic. Lil people. Saratobi echoed in amusement. Do you mean the two little boys who told me that you were lying down in the middle of the street? Why wouldn't they be? Huh? What happened to Ah? Uh, never mind, Naruto faltered, looking up at his only parental figure in his life. His eye threatened to twitch uncontrollably. How could they not be? They were almost hit by a fracking 10 meter long sign. Saratobi sighed worryingly, and Naruto felt a pang of guilt for making Oji Sen come all the way to the hospital to visit him, forgetting for a moment what he was going to ask. The feeling felt really odd though, like it was a foreign feeling. Before he could ponder that, Saratobi stood up slowly, breaking him out of his thoughts. I have to go now, Naruto, come visit me when you feel better, okay? He said with a small smile, before leaving out the door. Naruto stared at his retreating back before snuggling into the bed, trying to ignore the steady pounding in his head. Chakra exhaustion sucked. Soon, only the pitter-patter of the rain hitting the window was heard, and Naruto fell into a light slumber. Bed. Up. Naruto opened his eyes, as he was roughly awakened by a pair of hands, forcibly shaking him in consciousness. Looking up with groggy eyes, he saw the nurse that was here earlier with Oji-san, sneering down at him with utter disgust. Nodding obediently, he quickly got off the bed, changed, and was practically shoved out of the room. Still slightly sleepy, he walked clumsily down the empty hall. Naruto, with a panic jolt, realized the time, it was around midnight and pouring outside. Naruto felt a ping of dread rise up in him. The nurses had released him at this time for a reason, the drunken villagers. For some reason, the villagers always thought of him as dangerous at night time, and every night, Naruto had to avoid going outside at this time, because if he got caught by them. Well, it would be really unpleasant. But it wasn't like he was evil, it wasn't like he was a demon or anything. Right? Sure enough, as he took only five steps out of the hospital, he heard shouts coming in his direction. There he is. Over here people. Swearing profusely, a trait that he had gotten from many drunken people, he ran the opposite direction, taking random turns in hopes of losing them. Running down the deserted street, he found himself in the same place where he lost consciousness. Suddenly, he skidded to a halt, eyes looking in disbelief above the Kanoha bookstore. The sign wasn't there, it didn't even look like it was placed there in the first place. Like it didn't even exist. In fact, Sandane didn't look like he knew that the sign had miraculously disappeared, the two kids had told Oji-san that he had only collapsed, and not that he was racing over there to save them what the heck was going on. Angry voices reached his ears again, and Naruto broke out of his thoughts and ran off again. Flashed back over, he was surrounded. They were all shinobi, their forehead protectors proudly bearing the Kanoha symbol. Their breathed stank of alcohol and their expressions were twisted into triumphant sneers. In short, stereotypical drunken men. We all heard of what happened, demon spawn one of them sneered menacingly, slowly licking the blade of a kunai grasped in his hand. Naruto's eyes widened a little. The man was a chunin, with the common brown hair and brown eyes of most of the villagers. But most importantly, were his bloodshot eyes, his hair tied into a messy loose ponytail, and the fact that he recognized him. It was his bodyguard, Taichi, also known as Idiot-san. My kid saw it your cursed eyes were turning red as you were glaring at them. One screamed down at me in a panicked voice. We shouldn't have put so much trust in Hokage-sama. It's time you die. Five men charged at the small boy, his eyes shut tightly. Ureya sighed in contentment. It was the time. After many years, he had finally finished his newest novel, Itcha Itcha Paradise, he had a feeling that this one would launch him to stardom. Why, even the pouring rain wouldn't crush his spirits right No Crash, a small kid bumped straight into him. He looked scared and was breathing harshly. Jiraiya raised an eyebrow. Where were this brat's parents and why would he be let out at such an hour? And besides, what kind of a kid bumps into someone on a deserted street? The kid looked up at him, his red eyes widening in recognition under the blue cap he wore. From the Yuhi clan. Jiraiya mused silently. Jiraiya-sama. The kid exclaimed in awe. Jiraiya felt a large grin form on his face. Ah, so even the brats of Kanoha has heard of the great Toad Sanin. Jiraiya-sama. Boy blood. Screaming. The kid babbled in a panicked voice. The grin faltered a bit as Jiraiya took an actual look at him. The kid was probably around five years old and wearing a blue cap over black hair and red eyes. With his wide eyes and ragged breathe, he looked like a genin after his first kill. Speak up, Gaki, Jiraiya said firmly, placing his hands over the kid's trembling shoulders. There's the kid said, his voice shaky. Be back near the marketplace alleys there was a boy my age he was getting be beat up by drunken villagers. Blood everywhere Jiraiya felt the beginnings of unease in him. Drunken villagers. A boy. What was his hair color? Tell me. Jiraiya demanded, looking straight into the kid's large eyes. I'm not sure but I think it was a bright yellow. The kid yelped in shock as Jiraiya disappeared in a sudden gust of wind. His tearful red eyes followed the quickly retreating figure. After a few seconds, the kid straightened up, his breathe suddenly becoming normal again. 
His once frightened eyes were shadowed in the cap he wore. It was like he was an entirely different person. But the sudden rush of speed impossible for one his age, he slammed a fist into the wall next to him, the stone crumbling easily under the assault, leaving a bare hole. He disappeared. Fear. Dread. Panic. Pain. Hopelessness. Anxiety. Pain. Despair. Pain. But most of all, there was pain. He wasn't very fond of the color red. It reminded him of many things during his childhood. Memories of the agonizing sound of blades ripping through flesh, sadistic smirks seen through hazy eyes, lonely minutes, days, nights, years. No, he did not like the color red. Yet it defined him. It covered him. If there was a list of memories he could never forget, numbering 1 to 5, this one would be number 5. Naruto coughed out blood from his mouth. They surrounded him, their eyes full of satisfaction. It used to be ignorance, hidden contempt, but now. They really wanted to kill him. He was strung up on his hands onto the wall by kunai, the blade so sharp, it dug into his hands with his every movement. A cruel parody of the crucifix. Bruises littered his small body, and his hair was matted with so much blood, it was hard to distinguish the yellow from the red. The once white shirt was tattered, revealing shiny raw burns on his shoulders and arms. A single deep slash went through his ribs, deep enough to show the white bones gleaming in the moonlight. Some of the broken ends and flesh were black and black and burned, so that he wouldn't bleed to death. Naruto was breathing shallowly, his life leaving him with every exhale. This. Is. For. My. Sister. Drawing a katana, the man advanced on the hanged Naruto, and slowly began peeling the skin off his fingers, one by one, a grimy hand muffling his screams. Not so powerful, now, aren't you spit hit his face, mingling with the blood. Ha 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 ha, look at the abomination bleed. Naruto looked up, his brilliant blue eyes, the only color other than red on the child, staring unblinking at them. A shiver went through the drunken man, sobering them for a moment. Those eyes were full of pain and despair, a sin to have on a child. You know what? Naruto said slowly, as if realizing something. Abomination. Demon spawn. A near non-existent crack appeared in his cheerful mask. For the first time, despair wrecked through him like wildfire, the hated looks, the agony of every word, every whisper. A quiet but heartbreaking, hysterical laugh bubbled up in him, startling the man. Lou. If everybody hated me. Loathed me. Rejected me. He was only seven years old. Did other children his age have a life like his? No, a kid his age wasn't supposed to live alone, taking care of himself. A kid his age wasn't supposed to have 17 murder attempts on his life for the past year. Why the secrecy? Why the hatred? What the hell was he, anyway? Red. Why? Why did I even exist in the first place? Black. Sickening. That was the first word that came to Jiraiya. No, it wasn't a war zone, no, it wasn't a torture chamber, but it might have just as well been one. In actuality, the scene in front of him was a fucking typical night out for the Kanoha villagers. Naruto. Jiraiya screamed in horror. Anger. And guilt. Just what did he leave here in Kanoha? Just what kind of a life did Minato leave his son to? Killer intent drove out of him in one vicious course, leaving the drunken men frozen in fear, some pissing their pants. Good. But the speed known only to a Sanin, Jiraiya viciously attacked them, Rasengan in each hand, mercifully only at half power, launching them into the walls with a sickening crunch. Tears came unbidden in his eyes as he glared with fury at the fallen drunks. Just what the hell do you think you're all doing? Jiraiya screamed, losing his composure completely. You fucky Jiraiya stopped, gritting his teeth, chakra pulsing out of him in waves, most likely alerting the Hokage. He turned his head, fearful of what he was going to see. Naruto Naruto was still pinned to the wall, the blood dripping down the wall like rain. His head was leaning into his chest, and it looked like as if. Nara Jiraiya started in panic, racing over there. Naruto's face snapped upward, and Jiraiya saw dark red, almost black eyes staring back at him. They were deep voids, eyes of the dead. Suddenly, red slits appeared in those dark pupils. Bet. Away. Human. Said a menacing deep voice not belonging to Naruto. A burst of red chakra pulsed through the alley, the deep evil and sickening feeling of it, warning him to stay back. For a brief heartbeat, Jiraiya stood there, staring with unease at those strange eyes. Pain exploded on Jiraiya's body as cut slashed through his arms and body. He got knocked off his feet as something or some things attacked him. Landing hard against a wall with a pain grunt, he was starting to get up again when a cool metallic something hovered close to his jugular, the sharp edge pressed so hard that it drew blood. Something like fear swelled up inside Jiraiya as he made a startling realization. Whatever pressed against his neck and those other things that attacked him he couldn't see them. Was it the Kaiubi? Or was it Naruto himself? He slowly puts up his hands as a gesture of peace and the eyes continued staring at him warily, but then they widened slightly in recognition. Jiraiya, the voice murmured before the dark reddish black color faded from his eyes, replaced with a deep blue. Then Naruto fell unconscious.
Sandane was at his office, trying to concentrate on the paperwork to no avail. His thoughts were on Naruto, who was lying in the hospital. Jiraiya, covered in cuts and blood, had barged into the office, dispatching all the Anbu guards on the way, and said bluntly, Naruto's in the hospital. Villagers were attacking him, hanging him to the wall. Here he gritted his teeth, forcing the words out. By Kunai dug into his hands. He's in a comatose state. Jiraiya's face turned stony as he glared hatefully at his sensei, who had long dropped his cigar pipe in shock. We'll talk later, but right now. I'm going to see my godson. With one last look, he turned around and left, slamming the door so hard, cracks appeared in the corners. Sandane buried his face in his hands. Naruto. He had underestimated the hatred of the villagers. What exactly had Naruto been through his life? What could he do to help him? Right now, nothing. No one was willing to adopt Naruto, except maybe for Kakashi, but he was in Anbu and was a teenager. With missions and his inexperience, he wasn't suitable for parenthood. The council was already demanding a death sentence over the Kaiubi's chakra pulse nearly felt through the entire village. He had already pressed charges for assault against the drunken villagers who were handed over to Ibiki. But for Naruto Sandane's head rose up quickly as he got an idea. Sandane raised his left hand and two Anbu immediately popped into his office, giving him a respectful bow. Find Karasu and bring him here. Tell him he is needed on a solo S rank mission. The two Anbu nodded, but one, Wolf, stayed behind. He appeared to be struggling for what to do before finally collapsing onto a chair. Wolf slowly took off his mask, a gesture meaning that he was serious enough to break the Anbu code of never showing your identity. The blank face of Hada Kakashi was revealed as he adjusted it to the side of his head. How's Naruto, Hokage-sama? Kakashi said, the despair evident through his voice and how tight his grip was on the armrest. Sandame sighed, lighting his pipe again. He's in the hospital right now, Jiraiya should be there with him. Kakashi nodded slowly, still not quite believing what has happened. He'll live. But if it weren't for the Kaiubi's chakra, I doubt that he would have survived this. He added. Kakashi just nodded again, pausing as he considered the Sandame's weary expression, before bowing and leaving through the window, the only evidence of his anger were the burn marks on the armrests of the chair he sat on, still smoking from the chakra he had accidentally released. Sandame stared out of the window, looking down at his village. Naruto is only seven years old. They were blinded by hate and their loss. It was a wonder how Naruto was able to keep smiling despite the loneliness. Naruto's life and his future rested with Karasu. Okajama. Karasu reporting for the S-rank mission. Said a voice behind him. Sandane turned slowly. Karasu was an Anbu, still fresh as he had only taken three missions so far. His pale emotionless mask had black painted on it to look like a grotesque crow, intimidating and cold, yet it had an elegant air to it. He was only around 5'3", as he was still in his adolescent age. Take off your mask, Itachi-kun, this is an undercover mission. You must tell nobody about this, I am trusting you with my life. Okajama. Itachi said in slight shock, adjusting his mask to the side of his head, revealing a young face with long hair tight and a short ponytail, and long ebony bangs covering his black eyes. What do you think of Yuzumaki Naruto, Itachi-kun? The Jinchuriki boy? Itachi questioned politely. Other than that mild chakra surge from before, which has a sound reason behind it, I don't see how Yuzumaki-san could be considered a demon. He finished before looking up at the Sandane blankly, although anyone who knew the Ichiha prodigy would see the puzzlement in his eyes. That's exactly what I wanted to hear, Saratobi said with a small chuckle. Itachi widened his eyes a fraction. Somehow, that small chuckle was more intimidating than even Kasan's glare. What has he gotten himself into? Aichi shivered in the cold, limping towards his apartment. It wasn't fair. What did he do to deserve an interrogation with a Bicky, of all people? Another shiver wrecked his body, this time in fear. The man wasn't human, that was for sure. He could still feel the effects from his last technique, his limping legs sending him waves of pain. The 10,000 Ryo fine. This was preposterous. A Bicky had looked like he wanted to give more, but thank Kami for the counsel. They said that his actions were justified and wasn't much of a major offense. He only wanted to kill the demon. It was high time, after all. The demon had always called him, Idiot San, and mocked him at every chance he got. Plus, the brat had finally shown his real self, a fatal mistake. Why did Hokage-sama let him live, even when he did reveal those cursed red eyes of his? The seal was slipping, that was for sure, yet was he still alive? Yandane was a powerful Hokage, but he knew he shouldn't have put so much trust in the seal. Maybe he shouldn't have toyed with him for so long. And Jureya-sama had to stop him too. The man must have gone mental after those long years away from Kanoha. I mean, his teammate was that missing nin, Arachimaru, he had to have rubbed off of him. After nearly tripping over his own feet from the pain for nearly the twelfth time, Taichi sighed, before heading towards the hospital for some painkillers. The sight of the hospital made him widen his eyes in surprise. 
for above the roof was a man with a guitar. Cliché. Maybe. But why he would be near the hospital made him wonder. Usually, he would be at the roof on top of the demon's apartment and he would chat with him. At first, he thought the man came to that particular roof because he had sympathy for him, the unfortunate bodyguard of the demon spawn, but then why would be at the hospital and not there instead? Overcome by curiosity, the Chunin walked up there and approached the man. The mysterious man was wearing that old black outfit he always wore when he saw him, complete with a black cloak completely obscuring his face. When he talked, he had the deep voice customary of Anbu. You see, Anbu members had voice-changing chips on their masks to protect their identity. It was suspicious, but he really didn't care. If he wanted to kill the demon, he wouldn't object. The only time he would actually show his real voice was when he sang. And sing he did, nearly every night, accompanied by his acoustic guitar. The man was talented, that was for sure, and practically the only distraction he had during the nights guarding the brat. Chi sat next to the man, who gave no movements of noticing his presence, too focused on playing a song. It was a lullaby, soft yet melancholic, and he was humming to it. Taichi smiled a bit, his angry rants about the demon in his head fading away as he calmed down. Even during the times he was playing above the rooftops of the demon's apartment, he always played lullabies for some reason. The music ended, and the man tilted his head in Taichi's direction. Good evening, he greeted, absentmindedly plucking a few notes. Taichi nodded, waving a lazy gesture back at him. Any reason you're here? I'd say the same to you, Taichi shot back, leaning back against the hospital rooftops, inclining his head towards his companion. The man fully turned his head towards Taichi. I change places, sometimes, he answered quietly, still plucking a few strings. Needed painkillers, Taichi answered as well, and winced as a fresh wave of pain alerted him to his real reason of being here. He ignored it, he never missed a chat with a man, he was a very intriguing guy. I was in a interrogation with a bicky, don't ask. He sighed. You wouldn't mind playing a song, wouldn't you? The man whipped up his head at the mention of a bicky, but cracked his knuckles at the question. Hmm. Why not? Soon, the low but echoing sounds of him strumming his guitar filled the night, his sweet, low, but quiet tenor voice somehow managing to be heard above the guitar. Change. Everything you or everything you wear your number has been called. Fights and battles have begun revenge will surely come your hard times are ahead. Best you got to be the best you got to change the world and use this chance to be heard. Your time is now. The music suddenly stopped and Taichi felt a small amount of disappointment. Muse was one of his favorite bands and when sung by that man, well, it was pure genius. If that man ever quit Anbu, he would have made a very rich musician. Gotta go, the man grunted, adjusting his guitar to his back. Busy and all, Taichi grunted in agreement. I know what you mean, guarding that demon spawn is as frustrating as it can get. Taichi grumbled. The pay was practically the only reason I did it. I come, what was that? Taichi called out to the retreating figure on the rooftops. The man didn't pause, but kept walking away. Revenge will surely come, he said quietly. For some reason, that sentence sent a chill down his spine. A little bit intimidated, Taichi made the mistake of looking up at him, and the sight made his blood run cold. The mysterious man and Taichi kept meeting at night times. Taichi was fired as the bodyguard, replaced by an Anbu, but did stop to visit every once in a while, as he loved his songs. But he never did look him in the eye again, for they were cold as ice and simply unforgettable. He wondered how eyes could become like that, like as if the entire world had turned against it. He never dared to ask him though, the mere thought of them sent shivers down his spine. Frighteningly cold blue eyes. The five gates. To me, they were part of my mind, nothing more. But they were more important than that. It's like what I said. They were part of my mind, locked forever until I broke free. And only then, when I could truthfully say that I could go to the deepest parts of my mind, that I could go beyond that. Beyond my mind. But what exactly is after the mind? That's not important right now. But they will be. Don't be fooled by my seemingly innocence. Because I don't trust you, the reader of this book, to know everything yet. But as an act of trust, I'll give you a taste of my past. And of my future. Naruto. Where? Am I? Naruto opened his eyes, and what he saw wasn't exactly what he expected. He was in a sewer-like hallway, with water sloshing around his knees. A and it is supposed to be at his ankles, but he's only seven, and he's short P. The creepiest thing about the place were the walls, the darkest black, cracked and peeling at many places like badly covered paint. A thick red substance, looking suspiciously like blood, oozed down from the walls, only to dry up before it reached the waters. The wall itself had many pipes, colored blue, red, and black, traveling above it, the dark colors rushing inside it in frenzied waves. The colors, it seemed, lit up the hall in a dim, light purple tint. Looking up, the wall went as high as he could see, as it seemed to go deep into the darkness. All in all, the place had a dark and intimidating miasma around it. Naruto, with a jolt, realized that he was in his mind, and was shocked. 
This wasn't exactly what he thought his mind would look like. Nevertheless, Naruto was nervous, but bravely waded through the water, continuing down the hallway. As he walked, he kept silent, the only sound was the disturbed water echoing in the dark hall. It seemed like forever yet only seconds later when the hall split into different directions. Now, Naruto had no idea what to do. The hall had split into five different ways, but it seemed like as if there were large chains on three of them, leaving him with two choices. The right one at three o'clock was, to say the least, intimidating. It was bathed in a reddish glow, which seemed to pulse exactly like a heartbeat. Naruto sweat dropped as he looked at it and steadied himself before looking at the other open way, hoping it wasn't worse. The other open path at 9 o'clock was long and straight and looked completely ordinary. Well, other than the fact that it was calling to him, because when he took a step towards it, whispers filled his ears, and although he couldn't understand what the meat they were saying, he felt a strange pull towards it. Which to choose? Left or right? Good or evil? The choice of which path he would take would decide his destiny forever okay, that was a bit melodramatic, but seriously. The path with freaky whispering voices in his ears, or the one bathed in a blood-red glow, pulsing like it was alive. Naruto sighed with frustration. Taking a deep breath, Naruto turned left towards the hallway with the voices, hoping to whatever god there was in the shinobi world that he made the right choice. Trudging through the hallway was easier than expected. All he had to do was tune out the voices, and the path didn't seem half bad. Whistling a tune to drown out the voices, he faltered slightly when he recognized the tune. It was a lullaby. Soft yet melancholic. Flashback, I was stupid at that age. Stupid enough to believe everything they said. Stupid enough to believe that it would get better, that my entire life was just a stupid, stupid nightmare. At that time, I still had my innocence. My childish curiosity. Waking up in the middle of the night was normal. I guess it became normal, since I was an insomniac. I never did tell Oji Sen about it, he never knew that my nightmares happened every night. People always wanted to live their dreams. I got mine in a twisted way. If I always dreamt of blood, of pain, of ignorance, and the same thing happened when I was awake, then, of course, I'm living my dreams, aren't I? Like I said, I was stupid. A stupid four-year-old. One who cried every night, wishing to every single star in the night sky for something, just for anything to happen that was completely different from my world. Now, I know better. I know that a god won't help me. I know that crying is just a waste of your tears. It doesn't help, just makes you more depressed than you were before. I guess it was around that time that I bought a knife. It wasn't anything special, just a normal kunai from the second-hand store. I guess I was fascinated about it. How the blood dripping down my arms contrasted so smoothly against my skin. The pain just a small price to the beauty of the colors. Soon, it became normal, like my insomnia. Normal enough that I took it to the next level. Oji San would have been proud, I spelt my first word that day. D. D. M. O. N. Words were harder to do than a single line, it's like trying to draw a perfect circle on the wall using a nail. You may be wondering, why, though? Why words? Wasn't it more painful? Didn't it leave scars? Scars that would probably stay there for the rest of your life, constantly reminding you of your stupidity. I did it for one reason, and one reason only. Childish curiosity, remember? But then, the anything I had wished for happened. It was the middle of the night, the moonlight peering onto the bed through the cracked window. At that moment, the most random thing happened. Someone was playing a guitar. Whoever it was, he or she was really good, the notes plucked expertly. The first song he or she played was always that same lullaby, so delicately beautiful and the most heartbreaking. I never listened to the other songs that person played, if he or she even had any. I was fast asleep by that time. If I was still awake at that time, I would have noticed that my kunai was missing. But strangely enough, I never noticed it was gone after I slept. For the first time in days, I might add. That anonymous musician with a fetish for moonlight guitar playing was probably the key to my humanity at that age. Sometimes, I wondered why he would play on the roof of my apartment of all places. Maybe I had thought. Maybe he was there because he knew what others didn't, he knew that I was sinking into a depression hidden from everybody else. Then, my curiosity would act up again, and there were many times during the night that I had argued whether or not to going up there to meet him. But then the music would play, and I'd fall fast asleep before that thought even ended. And you know what? I think he did that on purpose. Flashback end, it was only after a few seconds that Naruto realized what he was looking at. Scrolled out over his left arm was the same scar he had engraved on himself, on his own skin. Demon. Long white bandages, the ones usually wrapped around his arm to hide the scar, had fluttered lazily to the ground, floating on top of the murky water. Naruto remembered when he had done it. It was the first time he had really noticed his healing factor, the way the cuts just seemed to close right in front of his eyes. He was obsessed with the pain and kept digging into his skin over and over and over again until the scar had finally became permanent. 
The only testimony to his childhood, the only visible scar proof of his stupidity. Do you have what we seek? Just then, straight in front of him, Naruto saw something move, startling him out of his thoughts. He blinked furiously, trying to locate it again. Naruto made a choking sound of surprise as the deep dark space a few meters in front of him glowed suddenly with a dark yet warm light, somehow contrasting to the despairing blackness around him. It pulsated, like the slow heartbeat of a sleeping child, a steady glow that basked Naruto in a kind of warmth. At that split second, the voices suddenly grew louder, echoing loudly in Naruto's ears, nearly making him buckle his knees. If I was only there faced, protect your precio, the nice, k, that the hell off he, I can't t, me san will have a shit about thy, mile for yourself, shut up. Naruto shouted, his hands over his ears. Miraculously, the whispers stopped, leaving a dead silence in the room. Naruto looked around with a dubious look, still disbelieved that that had actually worked. The breathe got caught in his throat as a blade found its way to his throat, appearing there fast as lightning. Or at least, he thinks it was a blade. The only thing he saw was the hilt out of the corner of his eye. Despite the urgency of the situation, he couldn't help but admire the work, the hilt was a silvery gray color, shimmering in the glow of the light. Thin but strong vine-like threads of silver wound its way up the invisible blade in an intricate pattern, while two long ribbons of pure black silk fell down from the base of the hilt, completing the look. Naruto was pulled out of his admiring by gentle voices, the words caressing into his ear, different from the loud echoes from before, as if it to compensate for his protest earlier. The blade dug deeper into his skin, drawing a bead of blood. Do you have what we seek? Dick. Talk. Tick. Talk. Hiraya's left eye twitched every second as he stared anxiously at the small figure in the hospital bed. It's been two days since that night, and he had practically never left his side, not even for peeking at the new hot springs that had just opened up. Okay, that was pushing it, but still, if Tsunade saw how the might Hiraya has fallen to one of an anxious, fretful mother, she's be laughing her butt off. And what a sexy butt that was too. Naruto's breath hitched a bit, and his eyebrows furrowed in pain, catching Jiraiya's attention. He sighed, going deeper into a depressed slump, staring blankly at his godson's blonde face, so much like his father's. Hiraya got up slowly from the bedside. All of this pessimistic thinking was really going to get back at him one day, just as long as it wouldn't be wrinkles. Giving an involuntary yawn, Jiraiya staggered to the room door, intent on getting some coffee. He was sauntering over to the cafeteria when he passed through the medication desks. His eyes raised up a notch as he recognized a person standing in front of it. Could it be? Damn it, I just need some more painkillers. Lost the last bottle yesterday, called the exasperated voice of Taichi from the front desk. Oh yes, he was going to enjoy this. Quick as a flash, Jiraiya appeared behind Taichi, who froze in fear, a kunai directed at his crotch. Hello, Taichi-san, remember me? Jiraiya whispered in his ear, a crazy glint appearing in his eye. Taichi eeped in terror, before fainting straight away, a distinct dark patch forming on his pants. Jurei ignored the shocked look of the hospital clerk, shaking his head in disappointment. This was a Konoha Chunin. He was almost too disgusted to even use chakra to finish him off. Almost. Kuchiya no Jutsu. Jurei said mentally as he bit his finger and with practiced ease, quickly formed the hand seals before slamming it onto the ground, intricate seals forming from his hands. Poof. A bright yellow frog roughly the size of Jurei appeared. He waved lazily at Jurea with a webbed hand, looked down at the sprawled unconscious form lying down beside him, and looked back up at him with amusement. He gave Jurea one last one-armed salute before sticking out his tongue, wrapping it roughly around the unconscious body, exceedingly careful not to touch the pants. The hospital nurses looked at the scene with a stupefied expression as the toad slowly spun in full circles, gaining momentum with every spin. Suddenly, he let go of the body in mid-spin, and Taichi crashing through a wall with a loud crash and sailed away into the horizon. Hiraya shielded his eyes from the sun with one hand, gazing at the quickly disappearing dot in the sky with a sigh of contentment before walking briskly to the front of the cafeteria line, dispatching the summoned frog simultaneously. The people behind him were smart enough not to protest. One black coffee, please. Jiraiya said cheerfully, slamming the coins onto the front counter. The cashier took one look at the crumbling wall and another at the grinning Sanin, before dashing away to fill his order, forgetting the coins on the counter. Later, rejuvenated by the caffeine, Jiraiya stretched and headed back to the cafeteria line, intent on getting some onigiri, the half-finished coffee held loosely in one hand. Being wide awake was such a wonderful thing, for it gave him optimism. D. The sun was shining, through the hole in the wall the birds were chirping, and who knows. Maybe Naruto would wake up Todd. Crash. A small red blur suddenly crashed into his backside, and with a silent cry of dismay, Jiraiya watched horrified as his coffee fell out of his grasp, falling down onto the ground with a dramatic thump. Jiraiya turned around, and I'm tears in his eyes, and was about to give the stranger a piece of his mind, when his eyes widened in recognition. You. Oh. 
Jureya-sama. Sprawled on the ground, grinning ear to ear, was the same boy Jureya had bumped into two days ago on that night, still wearing that familiar blue cap over his spiky black hair. He bowed low, nearly touching the ground. Goman. Goman. You see, I wasn't watching where I was going, actually I do that a lot. He chatted animatedly, still facing the ground. Why yesterday, I bumped into Kasan while doing the laundry, and oh. Jureya-sama. Jureya turned away briskly, trying to escape the babbling boy. With a groan, he realized he was following him, the boy literally skipping to keep pace. Suddenly, the kid's legs got tangled together, and he let out a yelp as he crashed into the floor. Eyebrows raised, Jureya glanced at the laughing boy laughing, he was actually laughing, before continuing walking, trying to hide an amused smile in his hand. 1. Jureya had no idea why the kid made him worry. Other than Naruto, he had wondered if the kid had managed to get home safely. That night, he looked scared shitless, his red eyes wide with fear. It was probably his first time seeing so much blood now it seemed that he was back to his real self, though he wasn't sure if that was a good thing or not. They waited in the cafeteria line Jureya had finally remembered that cutting in lines was bad in a peaceful silence. Just after that thought ended, the boy began shifting from right to left, humming a cheerful tune. Desperate to shut him up, the boy was getting adoring looks from the nurses, Jureya asked him the first question that popped in his head. Boy, Gaki. What exactly are you doing in the hospital? Jureya asked. The Gaki spun around energetically on his heels, before giving Jureya a thumbs up. I'm visiting Naruto-kun. Jureya looked at the kid in a new light, genuinely happy that Naruto had a good friend like him. Well, as long as his overloaded amount of hyperness didn't rub off of Naruto a hyper Naruto, combined with his above average amount of endurance, would be a total nightmare, but still, the kid seemed like a good friend, Naruto hasn't had a single visitor apart from himself and Saruto, I mean I haven't met him before, but he seems like a nice guy. Well, that thought just went down the drain. Just then, the duo reached the counter, and as Jureya began to think of what kind of onajiri he would get, he asked the boy another question. If you're visiting Naruto what are you doing in the cafeteria? The boy blushed sheepishly, scratching the back of his neck. Well, I rushed here this morning and skipped breakfast. With that reply, he sauntered up beside Jureya, standing on his tips of his toes to peer over the counter. Suddenly, he gave an exclaim of surprise. Sugoi. They have five different flavors of Raymond here. The boy jumped up and down in joy, before turning to the cashier lady, who was looking at him with hearts in her eyes. Ano two bowls of your finest chicken no, pork no, miso Raymond please, cashier lady said. He dug deep into his pockets, before opening his hands, revealing. Lint. The boy stared blankly at his hand, before looking up at Jureya, his red eyes sparkling in a sudden light. Jureya's eyes twitched, his eyes averted. But even man cannot withstand the puppy eye jutsu, and he half-heartedly gave him a few coins. The cashier lady happily accepted the coins, before handing over the two bowls of Raymond. Jureya stared in astonishment at the size of the bowls. One alone was equal to the size of the boy's head. How was he going to finish two? Do you really think you can finish two, Gaki? Jureya exclaimed, voicing his thoughts out loud. No way, Jureya-sama. One is for me, and one is for Naruto-kun, because, you know, he just woke up, what? Jureya sped off in the direction of Naruto's room, leaving the boy with a sense of deja vu at seeing the quickly retreating figure. The smell of the Raymond soon distracted him, though, and he took a delicate sip at the broth. Nay, it's still hot. Jureya opened the door with an audible creak and poked his head inside. His heart sank when he saw Naruto flinch at seeing him, but he masked it with a large smile. Ah no. I think I remember you, you saved me, na? Naruto pressed. Arigatou, mister, um. Jureya sat down heavily onto the chair beside the bed, running a hand through his shaggy white hair. Best get it over with now than later on. He stared nervously at the tiled floor. I'm your godfather. At seeing Naruto's blank look, Jureya mentally panicked, a chibi version inside his head screaming hysterically while running around in circles. What was he, stupid? He just had to be blunt, didn't he? I see, what's your name? Whatever Jureya expected, it wasn't that. He whipped his head around to meet Naruto's curious blue eyes, shocked that there wasn't a single bit of hatred or resentment in them. Aren't you mad? Jureya gaped in shock. I mean you've had the shittiest childhood in your life, your supposed guardian came only after seven years, and all you can say is what's your name? He babbled. I'm probably the worst fucking godfather in the world, I've ignored you, I've failed your father and if Naruto was shocked at his swear words, he didn't show it. He just smiled genuinely, interrupting Jureya in mid-babble. Uh, I can tell by your oh I mean, your speech thing, that you're feeling guilty about it. It's okay, really. It wasn't tea that bad. Ah oh, no, you must have had a reason for not being there. For me. Jureya could hear the underlying words in that sentence, and the stutter at the end really didn't help the squirming in his stomach. Nevertheless, he gave a shaky grin at Naruto, which was returned. 
My name is Jiraiya, he grinned, deciding to leave out the other titles. And with the way Naruto had just nodded in response, he most likely never heard of him anyway, Jiraiya added with a disappointed sigh. So Naruto began, looking at his newly proclaimed godfather. You said something about my father, right? What was he like? Although slightly panicked at the question, Jiraiya chuckled enthusiastically. Your father he was such a cool guy to hang out with. He had an air of respect around him, yet could put you at ease at the same time. He was cheerful nearly 24-7 and had this infectious grin so much like yours. Naruto had a stunned look on his face and smiled. Really? He asked excitedly. Yeah, in fact you share a lot of his qualities, Jiraiya laughed. You even have the same love of Raymond that he does. Naruto smiled briefly before looked at Jiraiya in confusion. How did you know that? He asked. I actually know a lot about you, Jiraiya confessed, looking up at the ceiling. I asked Saratobi to tell me all about you. He'd send me letters every week, so I'd know what's happening back here. I know your likes and dislikes, how tall you're getting, and that horrible orange suit you wear all the time. Hey. I happen to like orange. Jiraiya laughed at the pout on his face, which Naruto soon joined into a few seconds later. After their laughter died out, there was a pause of silence, before Naruto asked another question, this one more quieter. How did they die? Jiraiya looked back at his godson, wondering how to answer that. That question had probably haunted Naruto for years. He must have wondered at some time in his life why he was an orphan. Did they die in battle? Or did they leave him willingly, too cowardly to take care of a child? Jiraiya decided to tell him the truth, or at least, part of it. It was during the Kaiubi invasion seven years ago your mother. She died during childbirth, and your father managed to get to see you just before he joined the battle. His body was never found. Jiraiya smiled sadly, looking at Naruto. They were really excited about you. When they found out that they were going to have a son, your mother was screaming so loudly, hugging your father and dancing with joy. Naruto stared at Jiraiya in silence, before breaking out in a slowly forming smile, putting those words to memory. His parents hadn't abandoned him, they were happy to have a son, happy to have a family. For the first time, Naruto felt proud of his parents. Naruto was about to ask another question when there was a knock at the door. Of all the people to come in, he really didn't expect a boy wearing a blue cap he had never met before to come in. Suddenly, his eyes widened and he gave a dramatic gasp of surprise at seeing what he was holding. Raymond. The boy waved energetically at Naruto, nearly dropping the Raymond bowls in the process. He gestured frantically to the bowls, and an amused Jiraiya took them from him, and he collapsed onto the ground. Were you? Do you know how heavy those things are, and I still had to walk extra carefully so that I wouldn't spill. He huffed in annoyance, before grinning at Naruto. Hi, Naruto-kun, how are you today? At seeing Naruto's confused expression, Jiraiya rolled his eyes before introducing them. Naruto, this is the Gaki that told me where to find you. Naruto, this is Jiraiya paused, before looking at the kid. Wait what's your name again, kid? The kid smiled slyly under the blue cap he wore. Sorry, Kasan said not to talk to strangers. He said, sticking his tongue out at Jiraiya. Hey, what happened to Jiraiya-sama? Goman, Goman. But Kasan said that all old people are strangers, even if they seem nice to you, the boy replied innocently. She said, and I quote, old men are horny, drunk, and perverted bastards. Jiraiya stared down at him. Well, he couldn't compete with that logic. Sighing, he checked the time, and with a jolt, he realized he was almost late for a meeting with Siratobi. Jiraiya gave Naruto one last ruffle on his head, ignoring his protests. I gotta go for a bit, kid. But I'll come back, okay? Naruto nodded, and Jiraiya disappeared in a whirl of leaves, leaving the two together. How are you feeling, nah? The kid said, bouncing towards the chair Jiraiya had previously occupied. Naruto blinked at his hyperness, but answered the question nonetheless. Actually, Naruto said, stretching his arms. I hardly feel a thing. The kid, if it was possible, smiled wide, and Naruto was surprised at the genuine relief he felt from him. So anyway, Naruto began curiously. Why are you here? I mean, thanks and all for helping me from before, but I really hardly know you. The kid leaned back into his chair, grammatically stroking an imaginary beard on his chin. Truthfully, all I could think about the entire day was about the blood, the sickening sounds of knives cutting through you, the smell of burnt flesh. He answered quietly, his eyes in a faraway expression. Naruto shivered, he could practically feel the despair pulsing out from him in waves. Not to mention that his fairly descriptive words brought back unpleasant memories. There appeared to be more to the bubbly boy than it seemed. I had to make sure you were okay, or else my mind would have gone crazy, he continued, spinning the chair to meet Naruto's eyes. Red met blue. For the first time, Naruto saw the deep seriousness in those eyes, and for just one moment, he felt something black, completely black, from him, but it was gone a split second later. Suddenly, the kid smiled cheerfully, and the serious moment was gone. 
Well, at first I just wanted to check in and say hi, but you seem like a cool guy. He paused, then widened his eyes. Hey, that rhymed. Wait Naruto began slowly, in both awe and shock. You want to be friends or something? The kid bobbed his head as an answer. Trying to hide the warm feeling in his chest, Naruto laughed sheepishly. Truthfully I've never exactly had a friend before. Instead of looking at him with a pitying look, as Naruto feared him to do, he just awed loudly before saying, well, it starts like this. He jumped enthusiastically out of his chair in front of Naruto, surprising him. The name's Kano. He said, reaching out a hand. Naruto hesitated for a split second before grasping it firmly with a bandaged hand. Uzumaki Naruto. Replied Naruto with a mischievous grin. The two remained there, still shaking hands, until Kano glanced over at the two steaming bowls lying on the table beside him. Want a ramen eating contest? Ah, Jiraiya, you're finally here. Leaping out from the shadows, Jiraiya scowled and said, hey, I'm only late because the Gaki finally woke up. Ignoring the chair, he leaned against the wall, closely watching the hokage. Although Saratobi smiled at the news, there was still an air of tiredness around him. The attack must have hit him really hard to see the very people he was protecting attacking a little boy. Either that, or the paperwork has been stacking up again. So, Jiraiya, what would make you announce a meeting with me? Saratobi questioned lightly, lighting his pipe with a fire jutsu. It's about what happened two days ago. Saratobi leaned into his desk, staring at Jiraiya's posture, his hands folded over his chest, a frown on his face. He was serious. Continue, he said slowly. Jiraiya exhaled loudly, before closing his eyes, clearly reluctant about talking about that night. It happened after I found Naruto. After I drove away the attackers, I tried to approach him, but then his eyes opened. Jiraiya opened his eyes, staring at Saratobi. They were black. Not entirely black, like a sort of dark dark red. Truthfully, they scared the hell out of me, like looking into the darkness at the bottom of a well. At first, I thought that the Kaiubi had possessed him because they had the demon's pupils in them. Jiraiya rolled up a sleeve, revealing some bandages. Did you wonder why I arrived at your office all cut up? When I approached Naruto, the Kaiubi's voice warned me to stay away, and he forced me back. I didn't even sense the attack when cuts appeared all over me. The strangest thing was that I could feel them, the cold metal of the blade slicing my arms open, the knife pressed against my throat. But I couldn't sense them. Damn it, I couldn't see them at all. Saratobi's eyes were grave. Was it the Kaiubi's doing? He asked in a whisper. I don't think so, Jiraiya answered slowly, and his eyes widened as he continued. When Naruto was falling into unconsciousness, the slits disappeared before the dark red, meaning. The Dijutsu, Saratobi breathed, his eyes wide with shock. That's what I thought too, Jiraiya said grimly. This could cause a serious panic attack on the village if this gets out. If the villagers find out that the Jinchuriki has a bloodline limit, they'll become fearful about his new power. I see what you mean, Saratobi said, rubbing his temples. The manipulation and creation of invisible blades. Not to mention that there might be more secrets to the bloodline. People will be lining up to adopt him into their clans, and enemy villages will surely want his bloodline too. A repeat of the Hayuga kidnapping incident, Jiraiya added with a frustrated sigh. The two fell into silence, each in their own thoughts. Jiraiya stood up abruptly. I'll take care of Naruto, Jiraiya said suddenly. You know you can't do that, Jiraiya, Saratobi reprieved. A seven-seven-year-old child cannot be taken care of by a Sanin ninja traveling the lands for leads for Orochimaru. It's too dangerous. It's dangerous here too. Jiraiya shot back, collapsing against the wall. Jiraiya Saratobi said gently. You know that you're the only reason why Orochimaru hasn't gained much power through these years. You've been stopping his every move for the past seven years. What are we going to do if you just suddenly quit? You have a mission to do, you know that. Jiraiya snarled before banging his fist into the wall, making a dent in the wall. I told him I was his godfather. Saratobi's eyes widened. How am I going to tell him that I have to leave, again? Saratobi's eyes grew weary, his heart breaking over his student's misery. Maybe, if we just told the village the truth about Naruto's past. Jiraiya's head shot up quickly. No. Telling the village about Minato's secret will only make it worse. You and I know that. Jiraiya sunk to his knees against the wall and closed his eyes. Naruto, you have no idea exactly how much you are like your father. Flashback, this is all my fault Minato whispered mournfully, his voice muffled by the hands covering his face. I'm the worst father in the world. Jiraiya settled down beside his student, his heart breaking at seeing him finally break down. It has been three days three days since the assassination. Since Minato's son, his pride and joy, was killed by rogue nins. He could still remember it vividly. It was around 4 am when rogue nins had suddenly attacked the Namika's residence. They were both just finishing dispatching the few outside the grounds when a scream pierced the air. 
Minato had gone deathly pale and literally disappeared, faster than a bolt of lightning, towards the house, with Jiraiya at his heels. They arrived at his room just in time to see his face. That young, five-year-old face, an expression of sheer terror in his innocent blue eyes, before his head exploded in a burst of blood and gore, the body collapsing like a broken doll. Minato had frozen for a single second, just one single second before the world turned straight into hell. He screamed like a wounded animal, before throwing five shuriken at the attacker, viciously hitting him the arms, ribsage, and straight into his still laughing face, killing him instantly. The rest of them had no chance. Minato was still screaming himself hoarse, slashing left and right, blood slicing out from their throats at a perfect 90 degree angle, some left twisted and barely alive, with only with the upper half of their bodies, left to die a slow and painful death. Screams were heard by the entire village. It was only four minutes later, when the rain washed every trace of life left from the home, when Minato was left standing in the middle of the living room, caked in blood, and surrounded by mutilated carcasses when only the silence of the rain was heard, the screams at last fading away. It was only then that he started to cry. Jiraiya sensei Minato's dead voice whispered hoarsely, breaking Jiraiya out of his thoughts. The Anbu. They found this lying with one of the bodies he held out a headband, and Jiraiya's breath got caught in his throat. Chiseled into the metal plate on the front of the forehead protector was the symbol of the village hidden in the rock. I know we're at war right now. He stated numbly, staring at his hands. I know I shouldn't be feeling this but. Minato looked up at Jiraiya, and he saw those brilliant cerulean eyes, once filled with laughter and a carefree air, now hardening. If Jiraiya didn't see the rest of Minato's face, he would have sworn that they were from a different person, for those eyes were cold and merciless, eyes that has finally tasted the bitterness of loss. I swear I'm going to kill every last one of those bastards for what they did Minato said slowly, staring up at Jiraiya like as if he wasn't there. Not even when they're begging for mercy I'm going to kill every fucking one of them. There was a reason why the hidden rock held a grudge against the yellow flash. Why every parent was told to kill their child if they had blonde hair and blue eyes. For who could not remember that last battle between the hidden rock and the hidden leaf, when the yellow flash had single-handedly defeated an entire army in the span of a second. Few knew that Minato had insisted on going alone. And even fewer knew that he gave a heartbreaking ghost of a smile after the last of them died. But only one knew that each of those rock ninjas were decapitated, their heads rolling on the muddy grass, their expressions frozen in one of sheer terror. That person was Jiraiya himself, who had burnt the bodies, only seconds after the hidden rock had surrendered to the war. It was only years later that Minato finally let go of the past and had another son. But this time, he took no chances. The wedding was held in secret, and the boy the boy was given the surname Uzumaki to prevent the tragedy from ever happening again. It was such a cruel twist of fate that even with all his precautions, even with all the secrets, that his youngest son still managed to have a painful life, burdened by the hatred of the same villagers Minato had given his life for, believing that they would look to him as a hero. Uzumaki Naruto, the most pure and innocent boy with a painful past, the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, the unknown son of Namaka's Minato, the Yandame Hokage. Flashback end, Kano, age. 5, eye color. Red like Kurinai's hair. Black, slightly spiky, but not by much. It is short, but covers his ears, slightly like size, but a little longer and spikier. Height. Let's just say he's slightly shorter than Naruto. Appearance, because he is an orphan, he wears slightly worn clothes, mostly in the colors red, blue, white, and yellow. Right now, he is wearing a red and white striped t-shirt with baggy black shorts. He constantly wears a blue cap similar to the one Yuki from Fruits Basket wore as a child. It partially hides his red eyes. He wears brown sandals. Note I tried to make him as cute as possible, did it work? D. 1. I can imagine this paragraph so well in my head, and it makes me laugh every time xd. 2. You may be wondering what I meant by Naruto feeling Kano's despair, but that'll be explained fully in the next chapter. For those who read the original story, you already know what it is. I hope you enjoyed this chapter I certainly did haha, <laughs> there is a lot of talking, so I'm thinking of adding more action in the next chapter. Yes I know that Jiraiya used to leave Naruto before in the Anime, but here, he had seen firsthand what Naruto had experienced, so now, he doesn't want to leave. Hope you liked the bit about Naruto's past. He wasn't all accepting about it at first, and I wanted to explore on that. I hope you also liked the Minato thing. I never did know why he didn't just tell everyone about who Naruto's real father was. I mean, just BC of assassins. PLZ, since Naruto is Minato's son, Anbu will obviously guard him day and night then. I just didn't think that was much of an excuse so. Yeah, I added the older son who died after an assassination part to make the reason more better, you know. I also wanted to explore on Minato's dark side, which was pretty cool to type. Once again. Karasu, my bodyguard. He was weird, always silent and gloomy. How stereotypical of an Acha. I don't know how I didn't see it before. But Karasu is more than a stereotype. 
As you'll soon learn, he has loyalty far surpassing most of the shinobi. Loyalty usually only found in a hokage. Because a hokage would willingly sacrifice his life for the village. Karasu has done that and much more. Sometimes I wonder what would happen if he wasn't as loyal. If he was more power hungry and more willing to do anything for that power. But I'd scoff and dismiss that idea. Because an evil Karasu is just not Karasu anymore. The only chance of that happening is if he became mentally insane after his first air rank assassination mission. I'm surprised he hasn't cracked at that time. He was five years old. And Kano. He's just weird. Naruto S rank missions. Danger was nearly 100%. Most if not all shinobi coming back from those near fatal missions came back wounded or exhausted. Recommend for at least 3 jounin or a team of anbu. When Karasu 1 had gotten his first S rank mission, he really didn't expect to be inconspicuously handing upside down outside a hospital window, watching two kids eating ramen like there was no tomorrow. Suddenly, he was alerted to a high amount of chakra rapidly heading in his charge's direction. His tanto was out in a flash, and Karasu stood there, all muscles tense as chilling glowing red eyes stared out of the chrome mask, searching through the oblivious civilians. After a stiff moment of silence, he relaxed, sheathing his blade just as a white blur landed beside him. Karasu, Jureya greeted stiffly, crouched upside down beside him. Karasu felt a small amount of nervous respect as he nodded humbly back at him. Right beside him was the Toad Sanin, one of the three legendary Sanin of Kanoha, the students of the Hokage himself. And right now that Sanin was glaring at him openly, sizing him up in the familiar way an overprotective mother glares at the babysitter. Nerve-wracking. The small tilt of his head of Jurea's head was the only thing he displayed to show his apparent approval. Karasu let out a breathe he had been unknowingly holding, and Jurea chuckled. I'm late as it is, there's been an info leak on my the enemy, and I have to leave, Karasu nodded in understanding. If Naruto has any plans on being a ninja, give him these scrolls, Jiraiya continued, before handing the Anbu guard three medium-sized red scrolls. Karasu saw a small note attached indiscreetly on the largest one, his client's words scrawled on the front. Karasu lifted his eyes up when he heard the toad san and chuckle, and looked into the window just in time to see the ramen the two kids were previously eating, accidentally knocked down, spilling the semi-hot broth onto the hospital sheets. He glanced at Jurea, seeing him staring intently at the laughing boy with a blue cap, trying and failing to mop the mess up. Bagaki with the red eyes, keep an eye out for him, Jurea said suddenly. Although I couldn't sense a hinge, there's just something odd about his chakra. He added, a thoughtful look on his face. Karasu nodded again, taking the warning to memory. Oh and Karasu, Jurea whispered dramatically, his serious eyes staring deep into Itachi's. Remember, Naruto isn't supposed to know that he has a guard, protect him inconspicuously. I'm counting on you. Jiraiya disappears in a puff of smoke. It's been a few hours after that day. Karasu was taking his mission seriously. After all, even if he was only protecting the Jinchuriki from random minor villager attacks, it was still his first S-rank mission. He had already inconspicuously gave his client the scrolls, silently dropping it as they were too distracted with the Raymond contest. He had watched his client's expression reading the note, going from puzzlement to shock, then a ghost of a smile appeared on his face. Now hidden among the leaves, Itachi watched the two kids, huddling next to each other in the training grounds, whispering suspiciously. Now, if only they were facing this way instead of turning their backs to him, he could read their lips. Harasu mentally sighs as Kano smacked Naruto on the head. This was going to be a long mission. Dear Naruto. I'm sorry but I had to make an emergency leave. Do you remember when you said that I must have had a reason to leave? I do. My old teammate and now S-class missing Min is doing freak experiments and tests to try and get stronger and eventually take over Kanoha. I'm trying to stop him. I'm sorry I couldn't say goodbye to your face. Guess your godfather's a real coward. I could say sorry again and again, but there's not a lot of room on this napkin I'm riding on. Included with this note are ninja scrolls for Tejutsu and basic ninjutsu jinjutsu theories, along with 3000 Ryo. If you are anything like your father, you'd want to be a ninja. Good luck. Here's the important part. Naruto, you have a bloodline. It is one of the most dangerous I've ever seen so I want you to train with it. Train so you wouldn't accidentally kill someone. Yes, that happens. I'm researching as to how you have one, but right now, I'm guessing it's through the Uzumaki clan, on your mother's side. Until then, do not tell anyone you have a bloodline, except for those you really trust. A bloodline this powerful could cause the third shinobi war. I hope you understand. Lower, see you kid, Jiraiya. Naruto felt a small smile form on his face. It was a strange feeling to actually have a guardian looking after him, even if through a letter. Not that he didn't like it. Suddenly, the meaning of those hit him like a jackhammer. He had a bloodline. This had to explain the strange voices and the floating sword in his mind. It explained the way he had, one day, wanted to cut an apple, but didn't have a knife. 
Frowning in frustration, he was shocked when the apple suddenly split cleanly in half, like as if an invisible blade had sliced right through it. An invisible blade. Wait, what the hell? Uh, Naruto-kun. Are you okay? Kano questioned, repeatedly poking Naruto's shocked face. Naruto hesitated. He had known Kano for one day. Could he tell him the secret? He was only five, toddlers were known to babble a lot. But was he really five? Naruto recalled the many conversations with a little blue hat wearing kid. The way he had described the villagers beating him up was so gruesome. Despite his bubbly appearance, Kano uses grammar beyond his years. Wait, there was one thing he could do. After that night, he had woken up seeing a swirl of colors around him. It took him a while to adjust and longer to learn that he could turn the strange vision off. He had to flinch when Jiraiya poked his head into his room, the dizzying swirl of dark green, yellow, blue, and black gray recalling emotions of anxiousness, relief, and guilt nearly made him sick. There was only one explanation for this. He could see people's emotional auras. What was the word for this? An empath. But. If he could use that sense to look into Kano's aura, he might see if he was trustworthy enough. Kano looked at Naruto in confusion as he squinted back at him, his eyes slowly smoldering as black red wisps covered his eyes. Yellow happiness. Kano seemed really happy to be hanging out with him. A light silver gray. Naruto mentally smiled. Loyalty, Kano really wanted to be Naruto's friend and had already grown attached to him. Naruto's eyes furrowed as he saw another color swirling rapidly in the middle of Kano's aura. He dug deeper, trying to spot it among the other colors. Finally reaching it, Naruto gaped in shock. Black. Smoke. Everywhere. It blinded my already blurry vision, but I didn't care. I was leaping though the trees. I was so close. So close I had to make it in time. One leap later, I arrived in a clearing. Trees were toppled down, mercifully hiding the many corpses lying underneath. The evil, bloodthirsty miasma of a red chakra hung heavily over the area, nearly buckling my knees. Exhausted eyes darted upwards. A single ninja, the last among the 100 dead reinforcements, bravely trying to defend the village. I lifted my head and saw it. Nine tails, swirling unconsciously behind it. The orange fur, cloaked with the same demon red chakra, menacing and foul. The head of an ominous fox with long ears and a bloodthirsty grin. I stared grimly into the red eyes, the pupils slitted like a cat. The grin widened. Ho, Naruto. The blonde blinked as the real world came crashing down around his ears. His heart raced, what was that? What did he just see? Uh, yeah, Kano-chan. Naruto said absentmindedly, trying to clear his head. Kano shivered. Do not call me Kano-chan. He said fiercely, trying to look intimidating, but only managing to look cute. Naruto smiled. Whatever that was, it didn't matter. Kano ch, I mean, Kano k you know what, can I call just call you Kano? Naruto said in exasperation. Kano smiled under his cap, though it turned out more like a grimace. Okay, as long as you don't space out while I'm talking. He huffed. Okay, because I gotta tell you a secret, Naruto said seriously, beckoning Kano to come closer. Intrigued, Kano complied, plopping down beside him. Taking a deep breath, Naruto whispered in his ear. Well, I have a bloodline. Kano's childlike eyes widened significantly. He opened his mouth to say something, but Naruto quickly covered it with a hand, making Kano mock glare at him. It's supposed to be a secret, Naruto said seriously, shaking a finger at him. Can you keep it? Kano nodded, excitement gleaming in his red eyes. The second Naruto's hand came away from Kano's mouth, he blurted out, can you tell me about it? Naruto complied, an uncharacteristic thoughtful look on his face. I don't know a lot, but I'll tell you what I do know. I can create invisible blades and use it like kunai. When I do that, my eyes turn into dark red color. Also, I obtain another sense, like sight or smell, only I see the emotional auras of people. Kano gaped and awed his friend. That's so cool. Is that why we're at the training grounds, to train? Naruto nodded and Kano paused, a confused expression on his face. Wait, does that mean you want to be a ninja? Kano questioned. Naruto nodded, a painfully wide grin on his face. I'm going to be Hokage one day. He stated proudly. Kano nodded. But why? Caught off guard, Naruto paused before answering. That was the thing with Kano, sometimes he didn't react the way you would expect. I want to be Hokage so that people would finally recognize me. So that they would Fina Aitai. Kano had smacked him on the head, an uncharacteristic serious expression on his face. That is a childish dream. He stated. Being Hokage just for that reason is selfish. A Hokage is chosen, yes, for his power, but also for his selflessness. He has the responsibility to look after the entire village. To look after them, protect them. Just like the F4. Like the 4th Hokage, who sacrificed his life for the safety of his village. Are you willing to do the same thing in the future? Naruto was silent for a moment, struck dumb by Kano's accusations. Now that he thought about it, was his dream really that childish? 
Was he being selfish, wanting to be Hokage just for some respect? Was he willing to protect the same people who rejected his entire existence? Naruto hesitated before nodding. An unreadable emotion formed in Kano's bright red eyes before he smiled suddenly and said, well, Naruto-kun, then I'll help you. It was a strange sight, Itachi reasoned, seeing a five-year-old instructing a kid older than him on ninja training. The two friends have reached a sort of silent agreement, Kano would train Naruto, and in return he would swallow his pride for following someone two years younger than him. The boy pushed him, making him do laps rivaling Guy's amount, even on standard shinobi training like tree climbing and water walking. When Naruto asked how the hell Kano had known these things, he just vaguely replied, Kasen taught me. The excuse was so unlikely, even Naruto knew it was a lie. He knew the Kano was lying for a reason, though, so didn't push it. Itachi on the other hand, became even more suspicious, but without solid proof, he couldn't really do anything. A few weeks later, Naruto had, with the help of his new sensei, mastered tree climbing and water walking, being able to do it like it was second nature. Okay. Kano declared, after Naruto had done 30 laps around Konoha. Exhausted and sprawled out on the ground, he gave a weak glare towards his grinning friend. Said friend gave him a thumbs up similar to Mido guys, handing him some water. We worked on your endurance and your chakra control, so now, I think we can finally work on your, Kano paused before crouching low, his eyes darting around before stage whispering bloodline limit. Right, right, Naruto replied sarcastically, gaining his breath as he staggered upright. In a split second, he concentrated his chakra into his eyes, and the clear blue turned into a dead dark red, glowing in an otherworldly gleam. Naruto nodded to Kano, and the next second, Kano began flinging multiple banana cream pies in the air, and Naruto's eyebrows furrowed as he concentrated. Suddenly, two of the seven pies in the air sliced clean in half, the others being hit only on the tips or not at all. Gritting his teeth, Naruto waved an arm upwards, and the last pie exploded in a rip of cream and tinfoil, before he plopped down onto the ground in exhaustion. Currently watching the curious duo was Karasu, or Itachi, a slightly bemused expression on his face behind his crow mask, as he watched their antics. Where exactly did those pies come from? Unfortunately, five aerial projectiles coming his way in an agonizing slow motion broke his thoughts. With horror, he realized that the aerial projectiles were the remaining banana cream pies in the air, and secondly, he was currently crouching on a large thicket of bushes, the dead leaves underneath him, and the large leaves above him preventing him from moving without alerting his client to his position. Jiraiya's stern talk flashed in his mind. He was screwed. Garasu shut his eyes as five banana cream pies splattered on his face. Naruto and Kano sniggered at the faint splat of pie heard from afar. It began a few days ago when Naruto was testing his new vision when he saw an aura from the trees behind him. It was his bodyguard. Sande Moji Sen had told him that he had a bodyguard, since Jiraiya couldn't look after him. Kano and Naruto were slightly annoyed and curious that he hasn't shown his face yet and were determined to bring him out. Plus, Naruto hasn't ever tried to throw a pie in an Anbu's face before. In short, they had known he was therein from the beginning. A few more banana cream pies later, a small bird came, swooping around the duo before landing on Kano's head. Unperturbed, Kano happily stroked its golden brown feathers before taking a small scroll from its beak. Kano frowned as he read it. Suddenly, he snapped the scroll back into place, giving it back to the bird, who gave a quick nod before flying away. Sorry Naruto. Kano apologized, scratching the back of his head. Ka-san is expecting me back home. He paused before whispering in Naruto's ear. Good luck on guard-san. Kano straightened up quickly. See you later Naruto. He turned his head towards Karasu in the trees as he ran off. Bye, guard San. They knew. Bo and Karasu, Jiraiya whispered dramatically, his serious eyes staring deep into Itachi's. Remember, Naruto isn't supposed to know that he has a guard, protect him inconspicuously. I'm counting on you. Jiraiya disappears in a puff of smoke. Oh, he was pissed. It was night time and Naruto was bored. Kano had taught him the beginning katas of a tajutsu called Dance of the Dragon Child, which relied on a small frame and quick reflexes, speed, and endurance. Luckily Naruto had all of those requirements. Training wasn't supposed to be boring. Going through the first form, he gained speed as he got used to it, but he just wasn't into it. He stopped for a breather, looking up at the sky out the window. It was raining, and the quiet patter of the rain hitting the rooftops was the only sound heard through the house. After being with a chatty person like Kano, the silence afterwards, something he used to be accustomed to, seemed so lonely. Lost in his thoughts, Naruto made some ramen, slurping the noodles absentmindedly. The rain outside seemed to be growing steadier until it literally pounded against the roof. His thoughts strayed to his guard, probably sitting on a tree outside, in the rain. Guard San, do you want to come inside? Naruto called curiously out the window, sticking his head out into the downpour. There was silence. He didn't know why he just snapped, but as he heard no reply, a tick mark appeared on his forehead. 
Naruto slammed open the door and stormed outside, sitting on a log outside in the rain. Hey, guard-san, Naruto grinned largely, despite the cold clawing at him. If you don't come out here, I'm going to stay out here, but hey, aren't you supposed to take care of me? Garasu's eyes twitched as he watched the child waiting stubbornly outside in the rain. He'll play his game. After over four hours, Itachi was beginning to become worried. Naruto hasn't moved from his spot. How curious was his client. His stubbornness could rival his Itaudos. With that thought, a small hidden smile formed behind the emotionless mask he wore. It quickly disappeared as soon as it came. Naruto sneezed, his teeth chattering as he glared up at the greenish-gray ore in the woods. He slowly got up, aware of the painful numbness in his legs. I'm going to stay out here forever until you get here, Dadabeo. Naruto called out energetically. Suddenly, he staggered as his knees buckled under him. Naruto grimaced as he realized he was soon losing consciousness. Goodbye cruel world, Naruto whispered sarcastically. The last thing he felt before succumbing to the darkness was a pair of arms holding him up. Garasu silently carried his client back into the house. He was really light, abnormally so. And deathly cold, Karasu thought, feeling a bit of concern. After drying him off and tucking him firmly into the blankets, Karasu just stared blankly at his now snoring client. Of all the missions he had, it's been a long while since he had a babysitting mission, and that was way before when he was a genin. He really didn't have any idea of what he was supposed to do in this situation. Karasu noticed a soaked bandage on his arm and slowly removed it, expecting a wound. Staring at the scar, an unfamiliar emotion welled up inside Itachi. Sympathy. An emotion Karasu had always squashed, removing it to the furthest corners of his mind. Yet, this child had made then reappear again. Demon Karasu whispered, tracing the scar numbly. How are you still alive? Suddenly, Karasu heard music above near the rooftops. Slightly wary, Karasu went to investigate, but what he saw was not what he expected. Sure, Taichi San had reported an Enigma musician coming on top of Naruto's apartment to play songs, but he really didn't expect it to be true. Yet, here he was, strumming his guitar despite the rain pouring down his guitar and clothes. Karasu could see wet strands of hair poking out from under his black hood, but it was too dark to see the color. Sharingan, Karasu whispered, and red eyes glowed from beneath the chrome mask, staring at the man's frame. Nothing unusual, some off-color marks on his limbs, but that could have passed as an old battle wound or skin disease. Not one to be willingly in the rain, Karasu went back inside, not noticing the blue eyes staring at his retreating back. Do you have what we seek? It was darkness, everywhere. Naruto looked around frantically, searching for the voice. What are you looking for? Naruto asked in confusion. All the voices laughed quietly, as if that was a stupid question. They all spoke together, don't act innocent, child we are looking for. Naruto wakes up to sun rays glaring on his face through the curtain windows. He groans at the headache he has. Maybe staying out in the rain wasn't such a good idea. Suddenly, a looming mask appears in front of him, making him yelp in surprise. The creepy masked man silently handed him some porridge before retreating towards a chair beside him. Naruto sweat dropped, looking at the man and at the bowl in his hand, and then back again. He dipped his finger in the porridge warily and tasted it. It was warm and had a slight cinnamon taste to it. Touched, Naruto happily eats the still warm porridge, giving random glances to the person sitting on the chair, silently staring at him. The man was wearing the uniform of the Anbu elite, and his mask portrayed the face of a grotesque crow. Raven black hair poked out from beneath the mask. He tries to feel his aura, but it was hard to find. He felt slight amusement. Guard San. Naruto questioned warily. The man nodded stiffly, still staring at him. What's with the mask? I mean, do you get to choose what kind you get, because it's really creepy. Silence. Uh, thanks for the porridge, anyway. Silence. Your hair is really straight and long. Are you a girl or a guy? Twitch. Silence. Er, what's this lumpy stuff in here? Silence. Cauliflower. Naruto's ears perked up. Success. He has spoken. What's your name, na? Naruto pressed, bravely staring into the dark eyes beneath the mask. The guard tilted his head a little to the side, as if contemplating the question. There was silence for a brief second before he answered. Karasu. The next day, as Naruto and Kano began training again, Karasu looked over the pair on the roof in plain view, clearly not wanting another pie in the face. After Kano congratulated Naruto on revealing the identity of the guard, they both began poring over some of the scrolls Jiraiya had left. Naruto had already read the scrolls on ninjutsu theory, and they were trying to decipher the barely legible words on the Tajutsu scrolls. The scrolls had looked like they had been squashed, stomped on, and basically worse for wear, and combined with Jiraiya's already messy handwriting, they were hard-pressed on trying to learn from it. They come across a tajutsu called the Golden Dragon Style, an improved style of the Dance of the Dragon Child which Naruto was already learning. Kano unfortunately was not familiar with the style, which was a surprise, since he knew a lot of tajutsu styles. 
Er Naruto, does this say Pat Mikano asked, eyes furrowed in concentration as he stared at the scrolls, his face a centimeter away from the scroll itself. I'm pretty sure that's a K, not a P Naruto replied doubtfully, snatching the scroll and glaring at it as well. Tired of their constant chattering, Karasu decided to give them a nudge in the right direction. The word says Kata, Karasu drawled from the rooftops, reading the words using his Sharingan. The scroll is referring to the first Kata of the Golden Dragon style, by positioning your feet one behind the Karasu faltered. Heino and Naruto gaped at him simultaneously, looking at Karasu in a sudden light. Karasu-senpai. Can you teach us? Karasu blinks. It was one thing to be asked to teach it to Jutsu. It was another to teach it to five and seven-year-olds. He was Anbu, he wasn't supposed to teach them anything, only guard Naruto. That's it. Was it because of their puppy dog I'd look so similar to Sasuke's or the fact that he did not like being pestered? Whatever the reason, Itachi had no idea why he answered what he did. Fine, one year later, Naruto was about to enter his first day at the academy. Although Naruto had reached a sort of growth spurt, Kano, although six years old, looked no different in a year, still wearing that same blue cap. Ever since Karasu has been guarding Naruto, attacks on him, accidental or not, were slim to none, and the rage of the Anbu Crow became feared among the Kaiubi haters, to his satisfaction. All people threatening to do harm to Naruto were sent to the hospital with two broken arms, a shaved head, and an injured pride. Itachi had no idea how, but they managed to crack his mask a little. A feat supposedly impossible except for Sasuke. It was Naruto's special ability, after all, to touch the hearts of everyone he met, even Itachi. Karasu had even laughed once when Kano had dyed Naruto's hair pink. It had shocked himself, and although it was only a quiet chuckle that lasted for a brief second, he had laughed. Naruto was strong, that was for sure. Itachi had only told Naruto a few tips, but he had absorbed techniques and directions like a sponge. He was fast approaching high genin level, even a low chunin. Naruto had a dead aim, courtesy of the special dejutsu training Kano had him under. Naruto could manipulate ten blades simultaneously. He had managed to master the blades enough to have a low tune and level speed. The blades could only exist 5 meters away from Naruto, but the range was slowly increasing. In return, Naruto had taken off his mask when he was around them. It wasn't a physical mask, more of a mental one. Karasu was shocked that under the supposed obnoxious and overly cheerful mask was a mature and mellow child with a sarcastic tongue. It was mind-blowing. Heino had looked royally pissed after Naruto had nervously explained that he showed it in public so much that it became second nature to wear it near people. Aino had literally stormed off to a nearby training grounds, and Naruto and Karasu sweat dropped when loud explosions were heard from that area. Sorry, Naruto had said to Karasu, an uneasy expression on his face. Karasu had shook his head before flicking Naruto on the forehead. You shouldn't be, Karasu replied shortly and walked off to his apartment. When Kano comes back, tell him that we're having Raymond for dinner. Naruto smirked in amusement, though relief showed in his eyes. Rubbing his forehead, he walked casually off too in the Kano's direction. Boy, Kano-chan, you done killing the trees yet? No. Called out a fuming voice from the trees. And stop calling me Kano-chan. Naruto rolled his eyes. As Karasu read a magazine, waiting for the water to boil, and Kano vented his anger, one thought stayed in their mind. Naruto had entrusted his secret to them, and they weren't going to make Naruto regret that. It was lunchtime at Kanoha Academy, as Itachi watched Naruto chatting energetically with Haruno Sakura, a plain girl from a civilian family. Suddenly, he spotted a purple-haired girl spying at the two from behind a tree, a bright blush on her slightly sad face. Hi Uga Hinata, spying on his client. An amused smile formed on Karasu's face, hidden behind the mask. Somebody has a secret admirer. Later that day, Itachi Nai. You've been so busy. Are we still having the shuriken practice later? Itachi looked up as he pulled off his sandals and smiled at the hopeful expression on Sasuke's face. Sorry Sasuke. I have an important mission that requires me to be away for most of the time Itachi faltered, seeing Sasuke's downcast expression. I guess a few hours wouldn't hurt, though. He relented. Sasuke smiles happily. Arigato, Itachi Nai. I've been loads better, I've been practicing a lot and a lot. Itachi laughs softly before heading towards his room. Sasuke watches his Nai-san with a happy smile. Lately, his Nai-san has been more cheerful, and he actually laughed more. Nai-san never used to do that before. Nai Sen was an old grumpy pants with the face of a statue, especially when Tu Sen was around. Itachi was just opening his bedroom door when he was alerted to a presence behind him. Good morning, Anbu San. Itachi greeted politely, turning around to face the Anbu. He unconsciously tensed at seeing the man. Although his mask was at the side of his head, the man's face was emotionless as a robot. Itachi immediately recognized him as a root member. Unlike the Anbu, root members were taken from birth, and the ninja rules were pounded into their heads the moment they could talk. It was an empty existence. 
What brings you to the Ichiha residence? Anzu-sama immediately requests your presence, Ichiha-san. Itachi nodded automatically, hiding the sudden loud beating of his heart before following the root member. It was hours later when a drenched Itachi opened the front door to his house. Lightning illuminated the dark night outside, briefly revealing the many raindrops and downcast clouds. As soon as he opened the door, he was tackled by a small blue-black blur. The blue-black blur glowered at Itachi, an accusing scowl on his face. Itachi Nai. Sasuke said in a hurt voice. Where were you today? Did you forget your promise to help me with Shuri? Ken. Itachi Nai. Sasuke's previous annoyance melted at the sight of his brother. Itachi slowly pried Sasuke off him before collapsing against the door, his head resting on his knees. Long black bangs, the tips dripping from the rain, partially covered his dark eyes, which were staring blankly at the floor. Itachi Nai. Sasuke asked softly, crouching down in front of his older brother. Itachi Nai. Sasuke, Itachi said slowly in a hoarse voice, looking up at him. Sasuke was scared. Itachi sounded really sad, but he didn't look hurt. There wasn't any blood on him, and he didn't seem sick or anything. It's late. You should get to bed. Itachi said indifferently. His eyes told a different story as they appeared to be struggling with something. Itachi bit his lip. Itachi moved so fast, Sasu could only widen his eyes as Itachi's folded around him, holding him so tightly, like he would never let go. A voice whispered repeatedly into his ear, and Sasuke felt tears in his eyes, hearing the building anguish in his older brother's voice. I'm sorry I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nai-san. Sasuke said, his voice breaking at the end. Itachi quickly let go, his bangs hiding his face as he got up from the floor. Suddenly, he smiled down at Sasuke, running a hand through his wet hair. Sorry Itado, I forgot. Maybe we can do it tomorrow, okay? He poked Sasuke on the forehead before walking past him. Sasuke watched silently as his older brother walked up the stairs. What's wrong, Itachi Nai? He whispered in a worried tone. There's a lot of people out in the world. Every one of them has a unique life that is just theirs. But some people have ones worse than others. We have secrets, we have a darkness. But we're all the same and yet different. We want what the rest has. Something they took for granted. But why, then, are we always quiet? Why does the one who wants the most never accept the fact that they do? Why do they never reach for it? It's the same for everybody. When one loved another, he wanted so badly to tell her. But he doesn't. When one has a bad home life and is beaten and abused nearly every day, why does he turn to the darkness? Why would he stick that needle in his arm when there are people in the world wanting to help him? Is it pride? Is it stubbornness? Cowardice? Do we like this pain? We are the burdened. And because of our darkness, we don't turn to the light. Naruto, slinging the backpack over one shoulder, Naruto grinned as he made his way towards the academy. Today was his first day and he was unsurprisingly nervous. Casting a glance behind him, he felt some relief at the fact that Kano was watching him, albeit with a worried expression. Plastering a large grin on his face, Naruto entered through the door to the academy. Nara Shikamaru, Shikamaru. Yelled a female voice. Here. Ichiha Sasuke, um, here. Called out a voice from the back. All the girls simultaneously turned their heads to gaze up at the smiling face of an eight-year-old Sasuke. Eek. They screamed, large red hearts in their eyes. Sasuke, noticing them, smiled nervously and waved, and they dramatically fainted simultaneously. Kiba looked at them in bewilderment and edged to the far side of his table. Shut up class. Roared the Chunin teacher, Bolton Sensei. He was bald and had menacing cold blue eyes. Why he was an academy teacher, no one was certain. Why do we have to shut up? Kiba piped up in indignation. A small white puppy on top of his head barked in agreement, making the previously unconscious girls awe with its cuteness. Because people are sleeping, mumbled Shikamaru's voice from the back. Bolton massaged his temples before continuing. Yuzu. Bolton faltered, staring at the list. Yuzumaki. Naruto, he growled. A moment of silence filled the classroom before the whispers began. Yuzumaki. Isn't he that weird prankster kid? Brown. That guy wears way too much orange. Bolton exploded. Yuzumaki. Get your fucking ass down here or you'll fail the claw. He faltered as a small black sphere as small as a golf ball rolled into the room. He stared at it stupidly before he widened his eyes. Foo, boom. Smoke exploded from the smoke bomb, quickly enveloping the classroom. The teacher began swearing profusely as the girl shrieked in alarm and the guys coughed in alarm. The only one only mildly confused about this sudden random attack was Sasuke, who stood up warily, scanning the classroom and fingering a kunai. Suddenly, he whipped his head to the side as he saw Pai speedily heading his way. The Pai. Wa Sasuke said in confusion before ducking quickly. The pie flew over his head only to hit the person behind him. A small figure appeared from the clearing smoke. He wore a large grin on his face and wore the most eye-popping bright orange jumpsuit anybody has ever seen. 
In fact, if not for the fact that a shuriken holster was openly seen attached to his right leg, one wouldn't place him as a shinobi. Uzumaki Naruto, prankster extraordinaire. Naruto exclaimed, giving a thumbs up to the class. Everybody stared open-mouthed at him before a large growling sound was heard behind Naruto. Get to your seat, Uzumaki, Bolton stated slowly, glaring hatefully at him. Naruto's grin didn't falter as he headed towards his seat, hands behind his head. Okay, since it's your first days Bolton said, swinging a kunai on one finger. I'm evaluating your abilities. Tojutsu sparring outside. Partner up. He paused, staring intimidating at the silent class. Go. He roared. As everybody began partnering up, Sasuke slowly scanned the classroom. Most of the guys had already joined up with their friends, and the girls likewise. Some had a strange glint in their eyes as they approached him. There was a loud voice in Sasuke's mind screaming at him to avoid them at all cost, and he did so. But they were only girls, what harm could they do? One day, Sasuke. You learn. Desperately scanning the classroom, he found that, apart from the large amount of girls wanting to be partnered with him, there was only the orange kid available. Sighing nervously, he approached him. It wasn't like he hated him, it was just that his parents always told him not to go near him. Every day, he would spot the guy leaping from roof to roof, holding either a paint can or a big bundle of something, and nearly always jazzed by a large group of villagers. He was an orphan. He was a bad influence. A prankster. A no good son of a. Well, the list goes on and on. Smirking, Sasuke slid easily into the Ichiha taught to Jutsu and stared boldly at his opponent. Naruto grinned cheekily back before. The Iyag. He roared, charging recklessly at him. Sasuke was struck dumb at the most stupidest move he could do before compassing himself. In a flash, Sasuke leaped up above him, doing a graceful acrobatic flip in the air before landing behind Naruto. Naruto whipped around to block a punch but fell backwards as Sasuke kicked down at the bend of his knee, making him stagger. Whoa. Naruto exclaimed loudly, just as a punch flew a hair's length from his face and rolled away. Sasuke retreated as well, panting a little bit while easing back towards his stance. By then, all of the other spars have already finished and everybody was watching him. Bolton leaned casually against the wall, watching them intently. The already popular Sasuke was cheered by his fangirls, who screeched for his victory. Naruto grinned that already familiar wide grin before also easing to a stance. Sasuke's eyes furrowed in confusion. Naruto's stance was horribly off balance and his legs spread too wide apart. That stance would get him nowhere. Shrugging his shoulders mentally, Sasuke charged this time with a speed surprising for an academy student his age. Naruto hesitated before charging as well. Sasuke fainted right before ducking under Naruto's clumsy punch and did a quick uppercut with his left hand, slamming into Naruto's chin. The girls cheered wildly as Naruto was sent flying backwards and Sasuke grimaced at his throbbing knuckles. He was mildly surprised as Naruto got up again, wiping his chin with his arm. They stared at each other, blue eyes to black. Suddenly, Naruto cocked his head, easing out of his stance. Harasu? Naruto muttered in puzzlement. Sasuke looked at him weirdly before taking out some newly sharpened shuriken from his holster. That distraction was pretty lame, he thought. Time to up this a notch. All the girls gasped dramatically as Sasuke threw the shuriken. He hasn't practiced with them a lot, so his aim was a bit off, but they were still heading towards Naruto. Naruto quickly took out a kunai knife and held it up to block the, the kunai whipped through the air, embedding Naruto's hand to a tree. Gasping in both surprise and pain, Naruto let go of the kunai and it clattered onto the ground. Boy, no weapons allowed during the fights, Bolton drawled, another kunai spinning warningly on one finger. Naruto couldn't hear him. Pain. He couldn't breathe. Every part of his body was in agony. Kami, he couldn't breathe. He could only watch in dim horror as one of them advanced on him, a kunai knife in one hand. The man shoved him roughly to his feet before grabbing his hand and pinning it up above his head. Everybody jeered as the man, his face shrouded in shadows, grinned gleefully as, with one motion, stabbed the kunai savagely through his hand and onto the wood behind it, pinning his hand to the wall. Naruto screamed as his other hand was pinned above him as well, raising his body above the ground. His weight proved too much for the blade and the kunai dug deeper into his flesh as his weight lowered him down slowly to the ground. Stop Naruto whispered feebly. The shadows laughed at him sadistically, and his world began to spin, the dark colors swirling together. Snap out of it, Jinchuriki. Snapping his eyes open, Naruto gripped the kunai and, with one sharp jerk, he tugged free the blade from his hand, and everybody flinched simultaneously as the blood flowed profusely from the hand. Naruto dropped the blade in silence, before looking up at Bolton, his clear blue eyes staring emotionlessly at him. Inwardly, he was shaking like a leaf. He didn't think that the incident has shaken him up this much. Pushing the feeling into the back of his mind, he grinned widely, though his eyes stayed trained on Bolton. And to everybody else's shock, Bolton averted his eyes. Omen Nasai, Bolton Sensei. 
Naruto exclaimed, breaking the silence, as he scratched the back of his head. I guess I'll go to the nurse's office, haha. <laughs> he said, edging towards back towards the academy entrance. An awkward silence filled the air as the Naruto left. Was that really necessary? Muttered Shino from the back. Everybody looked from Shino and back to the teacher, whose eyes narrowed. I didn't say that weapons were allowed, Bolton barked out, making everybody flinch. Suck it up, you're all going to be ninjas. Everybody back to class. Bolton stormed back into the classroom, the students following him. So, did Sasu Kun win? I hope he doesn't do that to my hand, but you see all the blood. You what? Man, the orange kid sucks a lot, maybe I'll ask Kasan for a transfer. Sasuke, at the back of the crowd, glanced back at the bloody kunai left on the ground and jumped in surprise as a man leaped down from the trees before picking up the kunai. It was an anbu, dressed in the trademark white armor, his mask painted black in the form of a bird. Or more specifically a crow. The anbu looked up, his eyes, shadowed in the mask, staring at him. Sasuke felt a bit nervous as he walked gracefully towards him before depositing a paper note into his hand. Sasuke looked at the paper note curiously. Deliver that to Bolton Sensei. Do not read it, stated the Anbu, his voice a robotic deep bass. Um, oh okay, Sasuke stammered, a bit intimidated by the Anbu. He looked up at the Anbu. Seriously, that mask looked really creepy. Sasuke eyed the hair. It was black and was tied in a loose ponytail, the bangs hanging in front of the mask. It looked really familiar for some reason. Realization struck Sasuke and he warily asked, Itachi Nai. The Anbu paused before looking down at the child. No, civilian-san, the Anbu replied. Raising a finger, he poked Sasuke on the forehead. I am Karasu. Oh, Sasuke said with a small smile, rubbing his forehead. Well, Karasu-san, can you remind Itachi Nai that he promised to come to the market with me today? I am not a messenger. You should get to class, Karasu stated walking away. He paused. But I will deliver your message. Great. Sasuke smiled happily before retreating into the classroom. Behind his mask, Itachi smiled sadly before disappearing in a whirl of leaves. Sasuke walked into the quiet classroom, the class was doing some questions from the shinobi handbook, and the orange kid hasn't come back yet. The teacher was lounging in his desk, reading a strange orange book Sasuke had always seen his Tusan reading nowadays. Whatever it was, it made us curious. Whenever he went outside, nearly all the male adults were reading it. It was sure popular. Ichiha. Get to your seat. Barked Bolton. Ah no, Bolton sensei, Sasuke piped up. I have a note for you, he handed Bolton the note before walking back towards his seat. Grumbling, Bolton snatched the note and opened it. As he read it, he got paler and paler before crumbling the note with one hand. G get to work, class, Bolton stammered and left out the door. The class stared at the closing door before shrugging. Just then, Naruto came sauntering into the classroom, his hands neatly bandaged. Sasuke spared him one curious glance before sitting on the nearest seat. A girl with pink hair, whose name he couldn't recall, blushed furiously as he sat down, though he took no notice of it. Naruto stared down at this textbook. It was torn and held only by a large number of staplers. Not only that, but the contents were definitely not for Academy first years. Naruto felt a deep disappointment within him. Judging by how Kano described the Academy, he had imagined that he would at least get treated the same as anyone else here. Guess not. Hey, do you get question one? Naruto asked the person beside him, nudging him with an elbow. The person beside him wore the strangest set of clothes Naruto had ever seen. Well, apart from himself. Well he wore normal grey pants with a shuriken holster, he also wore a large shirt with an upturned collar, which hide the lower half of his face. He also had a unique hairstyle, large and spiky brown hair that oddly reminded Naruto of an afro. Except that it wasn't fuzzy at all. Dark sunglasses covered his eyes, even though they were indoors. He inclined his head towards Naruto. Judging by his aura, he was mildly surprised that he was talking to him. But for what reason why, he had no idea. He took one glance at the booklet and said quietly, you have the wrong booklet, and returned to his work. Naruto wasn't listening, though. He watched, fascinated, as the spiky afro kid turned back and did his work, only for bugs to curl up his hands and arms as he did so. They were so small and jittery and reminded Naruto of the bugs he had seen crawling around in a dead tree stump. Wow, that's so cool, Naruto exclaimed quietly, touching his finger to his hand. The small bug crawled onto his finger, scuttling around and around it in a dizzy routine. Cool. The person, Aburam Shino, looked up at him in surprise, or as much surprise as one could tell from behind his dark tinted specks. He slowly raised a finger to Naruto's hand, and the small bug crawled back obediently onto it. Before Naruto could reply, a pink-haired girl from across the table reached over to see Naruto's booklet and said timidly, Um, question one is. The five elements are water, fire, earth, wind, and lightning. Naruto grinned widely in thanks, but some girls behind Sakura snorted simultaneously. Great. 
Forehead girl is also a smarty pants too, one of them whispered audibly to another. The others giggled and Sakura looked crestfallen. Naruto stared at the giggling girls, and they looked unnerved, their giggles fading away. Naruto's striking blue eyes were looking directly at them, the large grin absent from his face. One of them blushed, he actually looked hot without that dorky expression on his face. Just then the lunch bell rang, and Naruto turned away, leaving four speechless girls. Everybody stood up, sending curious glances at the teacher's desk, he wasn't back yet. Naruto was the first to leave, walking up the stairs onto the rooftops. The grin faded from his face, and he slid down against the fence, slouching against the wires. He rolled his head towards his right to see Karasu sitting crouched down sideways against the fence, his feet sticking against the metal. Hey, what happened to the Bolton guy? Naruto asked casually, pulling out a bento box and snapping apart his chopsticks. Let's just say, he won't be teaching anymore, Karasu said, a smirk playing on his face beneath the mask. Naruto snorted in amusement. You know, it wasn't that serious, Naruto added, gesturing to his bandaged hand. I saw your face when it happened, Karasu stated. Don't tell me that was nothing. If Kano was here, he'd beat the shit out of him. Six year old or not. A year ago, Karasu might have said nothing, but now, his personality has fleshed out a bit more. Naruto couldn't believe that under that emotionless exterior was a laid-back man with a dry humor and a sense of loyalty. But in the battlefield, he was a respected graceful and skilled Anbu. The sound of a fight was heard down at the academy grounds. Naruto glanced down in curiosity and saw the four girls from before, surrounding the pink-haired girl behind the back of the playground. His eyes flashed black. You and your stupid hero complex, Karasu muttered to himself as Naruto rushed down there. Hey. What do you think you're doing? Naruto shouted in indignation, pointing a finger at the crowd. They paused in their teasing, looking at him with a dumbfounded expression, before snarling in annoyance. Go away, orange kid, we're busy here, one of them growled. The rest cracked their knuckles in a seemingly intimidating way. I am Yuzumaki Naruto. And as the next Hokage, I demand that you stop right now, Dadabeo. Naruto yelled, although he cringed mentally inside. The bullies paused, blinking as their ears adjusted to the Naruto level volume, before snarling again. Oh yeah? Let's teach him a lesson. They were starting to advance when Karasu jumped down from the rooftops, landing in a cat-like crouch on the ground. He slowly raised his head, the crow-like mask staring blankly at the girls. Naruto mentally rolled his eyes. The girl shrieked in horror before running back to the academy. We'll get back at you for this. Be ek. Freak. Naruto ignored them, grinning up at Karasu. Karasu nodded once before disappearing. Sakura looked nervously at the spot where Karasu disappeared, before whipping the tears off from her face. Are you okay? Naruto asked with concern, pulling out his hand. Sakura nods shyly and grabs his hand. Who was that? Sakura asked, pointing to the spot where Karasu disappeared. Oh. Naruto said, scratching the back of head sheepishly for the second time that day. He searched his head quickly for an excuse. That was just a random dude who hates bullying. Knees. Ah Sakura nods her head in understanding. Suddenly, she smiled up at Naruto. Thank you, she smiled. Naruto was surprised. He could actually feel the gratitude in her aura. He smiled back. Uh no problem Naruto mumbled, averting his eyes. Sakura's eyes opened with sudden realization, and she dug into her pocket. Um, do you want a cookie? She asked innocently, dangling a cookie in front of his face. Later on, as he was walking home, only one thought was in Naruto's mind. He never knew cookies could taste so nice. Inada walked home in a depression. It was her first day at the academy, and it was both the worst and best day in her life. First of all, she had started the day with a pie in her face. The boy what was his name, Sasuke. Yes Sasuke. Well, anyway, he had suddenly ducked, and a pie splattered on her face. The pie. Of all things. Then she saw him. The boy that Tusama had directly instructed her to avoid. He was wearing so much orange. And he was a prankster, famous for the Hyuga undergarment flag incident. But the most important thing was he had the most cutest whisker marks on his face. Wait, cute. Yes, that's right. Hayuga Hinata was in love with the worst person she could fall in love with. The number one on her father's hate list. Kaya, this was just like something out of a Romeo and Juliet story. Uzumaki Naruto. There was just something about his attitude that she loved. His determination and his smile. No, not that wide grin that he would give 24-7. That small content smile he would show when no one else was looking. He had given it to that strange Anbu man before. He had given it to that Haruno person. At that thought, Hinata fell into a deeper depression. So dark, she was hardly noticing where she was going and bumped into a person, sending them both butt first on the ground. Oh, Goman Nasai. Hinata spluttered, helping him up. Suddenly, her heart stopped as she stared openly at the person she bumped into. 
her mind went into overdrive, and the world tipped dangerously as a chibi Hinata screamed in panic inside her mind. No, no. My fault, Naruto apologized, a smile hovering on his lips, oblivious to the inner conflict in Hinata's mind. You smiled Hinata said in a daze. Uh, yes. Naruto said, a question mark popping above his head. Hinata blushed furiously, her index fingers subconsciously poking themselves, as she bowed her head. Ah no, never mind Gomen, Gomen I have to go. With that, Hinata retreated off into the distance. Naruto scrutinized the rapidly disappearing figure on the road. Her aura was red. Like a tomato. Like her face. Was she sick? Oh oh. Red usually represented anger or some other negative emotion, but the girl didn't seem to be pissed off in any way. Shrugging, Naruto continued on his way home, but he staggered abruptly when he felt a stabbing pain in his eyes. Ow. As soon as it came, it was gone, and Naruto squinted in the light. Was the world supposed to be sideways? Naruto's eyes shut instinctively as the world soon became spinning like a top. Dimly, he realized he was leaning against the wall and that a familiar Anbu mask was swimming in front of his face. Naruto. Are you alright? Naruto blinked furiously and the world slowly slid back to normal. He grinned enthusiastically up at Karasu. Did as a fiddle, Dadabeo. Karasu's eyes narrowed. There were a million possibilities. One was that Naruto hasn't taken his vitamins like any eight-year-old was supposed to. Or, some stupid ninja had tried to cast a Jinjutsu just to spite him. He cautiously scanned the area, but other than some passing villagers a few meters away, there weren't any shinobi in the area. Karasu sighed. He had to time for this. Please don't say Dadabeo. Come on, I'll shunshin you home. I'm in a hurry right now. With that, Karasu took a hand on Naruto's shoulder, and they both disappeared in a whirl of leaves. The first thing Naruto saw when he opened his eyes was a small blur coming quickly towards him. Hey man, how was school? Kano exclaimed, jumping on top of Naruto's shoulders. Both of them came crashing down onto the floor. Interesting, Naruto replied vaguely, prying Kano off him as he got off the floor. Met a dude who looked like him. He added, jerking his head towards Karasu. The result of a steamy night with one dog, a banana, and two drunk girls. Kano offered up, a smirk hidden under his cap. Karasu rolled his eyes under the mask. No, it's my Itado, Sasuke. Really? Naruto added, his eyes lifting up suggestively. Karasu sighed. I have no time for this. Naruto, Raymond's in the kitchen. Go to bed after you finish those katas I told you to do. And you, Karasu pointed at Kano, who grinned sheepishly. Go home for once. Kano ignored him as he collapsed lazily onto the couch. Naruto was about to go check the Raymond in the kitchen cautiously. Karasu wasn't known as a good cook when suddenly, Karasu dug into his pocket and came up with a tiny red present. Early birthday present, he murmured. Why aren't you going to be there? Naruto shot back, his eyes staring at Karasu suspiciously as he fingered the present. It felt heavy in his hands and kind of felt bulky, as if there was more than one thing inside. And to Naruto's growing suspicion, Karasu's aura darkened quickly, although he didn't betray his expression. You're in the academy, and soon, you won't need a bodyguard anymore. I won't be here 24-7 forever. And, with one quick nod, Karasu disappeared in another whirl of leaves. A minute Karasu was gone, Naruto curiously opened the carefully wrapped package. Inside was, to both Naruto's and Kano's surprise, an Anbu mask. It was an interesting black color, with intricate white swirls painted on it in the form of a kind of wild cat. The three whiskers on the side were strikingly similar to Naruto's, although they pointed downwards more to the jawline. Naruto picked it up gingerly, and underneath the mask was a note. You do not have a name. You do not have an identity. You fight and you kill and you die for the sake of Konoha. You are Anbu. You are Pantera. Under the note was another one, this one by Karasu. When you think you are ready, you may join Anbu. The man listed was for Pantera went off duty because his wife was pregnant. He doesn't exist, obviously. Happy birthday, earn the notes after you've done reading them. Wow, Naruto whispered, his finger tracing the white swirls on the mask. He thinks I can make it into Anbu. One day Kano voiced out loud, a proud smile on his face as he watched Naruto. Jaguar-kun. He added cheekily. Okay. Naruto said, a large grin forming on his face. Guess I should start training more then. Come on Kano, to the training grounds. Naruto grabbed Kano, and they both raced outside the apartment. The training grounds Naruto was talking about was just outside the apartment. It had been used a few years ago, but was long abandoned from being overused. There was still evidence from them judging by the scorch marks and abandoned rusty kunai on the trees and the many cracks and random holes in the ground. A few meters away, there was a small stream, but too shallow for any fish to live there. For Naruto and Kano, it was perfect, as they would be totally alone and undisturbed. Didn't have to pull me. Kano muttered with resentment as they both finally arrived there. Naruto snorted with amusement before facing Kano, his hands and feet formed into the golden dragon style. 
They no sighed mumbling words that sounded like how impatient before forming into a stance Naruto wasn't familiar with. Kano had instructed Naruto that there were over 1000 different styles out there, and Naruto had to be prepared to face all of them. Naruto respected Kano as a Tajutsu specialist. A six-year-old Tajutsu specialist. Unlike Naruto, who only knew one Tajutsu style, Kano formed different stances nearly every day and used each of them skillfully, like a master. How he knew so many was a mystery. Kano cracked his neck before rushing towards Naruto with a breakneck speed. Prepared for that, Naruto twisted his body to the side, his rotating feet stirring clouds of dust on the ground. He came behind Kano with a chop towards his back, but Kano reacted. Kano dropped to the ground with his hands and using momentum, kicked Naruto in the face, sending him clear into the sky before launching some shuriken up at him. Helpless, Naruto mentally cursed, but his eyes turned into a familiar deep reddish black and he snapped his fingers. The shuriken simultaneously sliced cleanly in half and Naruto landed gracefully onto the ground. Without missing a heartbeat, he snapped his wrist in an upward motion and there was a whoosh of air as a whirl of blades formed, heading towards Kano. Kano grinned, cartwheeled to the side, as the blades passed him by. Careful, Baka, he taunted. Your butter knives may be invisible, but they're still solid and I can hear them rushing through the air. Naruto stuck his tongue out in a rare moment of childishness before smirking. Suddenly, there was another stabbing pain at the back of his eyes again and he stumbled. Ignoring it, he backflipped up onto a tree branch and, gathering chakra, clapped his hands. Buck, Kano swore as he glanced at the ground. What appeared to be thousands of tiny black shards on the ground were actually thousands of blades hovering in the sky, the sun forming their shadows. The blades rained down from the sky and there was a large cloud of dust as the ground became a large pincushion. Naruto panted heavily, leaning against the tree as he squinted through the dust, the beginnings of panic rising. It was quiet, too quiet. He was experimenting with his blades and came up with the attack just yesterday and wanted to try it out. Did he go too far? Could he have accidentally killed Kano? Almost got me there man, whispered a voice in his ear. Naruto finally noticed the sharp metal of a kunai poking against his back. But seriously, you need to watch your guard. A powerful attack leaves people weak and tired. Instead of panicking, you should have scanned the area with your bloodline and checked for survivors or for an enemy watching you, waiting for an opening. Six-year-olds shouldn't swear, Naruto shot back lamely. Kano grinned cheekily as a reply, and they both straightened up. Kano glanced down at the ground and whistled. The entire area was embedded with large cracks and holes. Your control is getting better, Kano commented, crouching down on the ground and inspecting the holes. Your power too. Naruto wasn't listening, as the pain increased until it felt like as if his eyes were on fire. He grimaced and collapsed on the ground. Naruto opened his eyes. It was dark, completely dark. But suddenly, he felt a sharp pain on his throat. It was the sword. Again. Do you have what we seek? Oh come on, Naruto said with a sigh, although he was inwardly nervous. Not this dream again. The voices made a sound that seemed like they were laughing, and it echoed in the darkness. Suddenly, there was an unexpected pressure on his mind. What are yo the day's memories flashed through Naruto's eyes. The academy, the pink-haired girl, when he bumped into Hinata, the Anbu mask. It stopped suddenly, leaving Naruto panting and tensed against the sword. The voices were silent and for a long time they were, leaving Naruto standing there in the darkness. Finally it spoke. So, child, I guess you do. The darkness shattered, leaving Naruto on his knees in murky water. He was back in his mind, in front of the crossroads leading to the five gates. He glanced up as the gate on the right exploded in a bright light. The kanji for destiny appeared at the top of gate. The hallway disappeared and in its place was a large mirror. Naruto's eyes widened. His dark red eyes looked different. Unlike before, when it was just a blank dark red color, the pupil was now visible, and while the color was still a dark red, the pupil has shaped into a three-pointed pure black star, nearly blending in with its background. Naruto's reflection smiled back at Naruto. It spoke. We are. Kuroberigan Black Rose Eye. Outside Naruto's mind, hundreds of small blades explode around Naruto in a tornado, making Kano yelp in surprise, as cuts appeared on his arms. Naruto looked at the blades blankly. Unlike before, when even he couldn't see them, they were visible now and were a dark red color, shaped like the broken pieces of a mirror, small but deadly. Can you see them, Kano? Naruto asked Kano blankly. The blades. The what? No. Kano said slowly, scrutinizing Naruto. His eyes widened as he took in Naruto's eyes. Whoa. What the hell happened to you? Shrugging, Naruto snapped his fingers towards a tree. He watched in awe as the blood red blades formed together into a large black arrowhead before assaulting the unfortunate tree. The tree tore in half in a burst of splinters. Already low on chakra, Naruto falls on one knee, the world spinning dangerously. What was that? Kano tentatively approached the tree, whistling softly as he touched the leaking sap. 
I think you actually fucking unlocked the next stage. He said, a grin growing on his face. Nice eyes, by the way. With its lightly bended edges, it looks like some sort of a black flower, spinning slowly as it floats on a puddle of dark blood. Stop swearing, Kano-chan, Naruto said absentmindedly, staring at the blades whirling around him. That was the thing with Kano. On one hand, he was an innocent, hyper, and happy-go-lucky little kid, but on the other hand, Kano knows grammar far beyond his years. He swears a lot when he's in the mood and, if he chooses, has a mature air around him. Not only does he have a sadistic streak and a tendency for violent and extremely detailed similes, but he also knows shinobi techniques, styles, and has the gracefulness and knowledge of Jounin. It was plain weird. And there was the fact about his aura. Kano's inner aura, the distinct color and the deepest part of one's soul was completely black, something Naruto hasn't seen before. Not even Itachi's, which was a shimmering silver. But whenever Naruto asks Kano about it, he would answer vaguely before changing the subject completely. Soon, Naruto knew better than to ask. He would tell him when he wanted. That didn't stop him from being curious, though. Gurubarigan, Naruto said suddenly, facing Kano. That's my bloodline. Black Rose Kano commented, grabbing one of the blades out of thin air and toying with it. How? Appropriate. He added with a smirk. It was nearing midnight as the duo began their walk back home. The full moon had an unnatural red tint to it, making Kano nervous, so they hurried home. Naruto was silent as they walked. Or at least, one walked while the other perched on his shoulders, humming a Christmas carol. Sue. Been a busy day, Kano said out loud, tapping on Naruto's head. H.N., Naruto murmured in agreement. We're continuing training tomorrow, 5 a.m. sharp. H.N., what are you, and H.N., yeah. Kano snorted. Wonder where Karasu went. He voiced out loud. Yeah, Naruto agreed. There was a nagging feeling at the back of his mind. Naruto stopped suddenly, his eyes wide. Oh fuck he whispered. Hey Kano, wanna walk with me to the academy? Naruto asked casually to cover up how nervous he was. Kano bobbed his head in agreement, but instead of walking out the door, jumped onto a table and onto Naruto's shoulders, like some kind of a monkey. Wonder where Karasu went this morning? Kano questioned Naruto as he rested his elbow on his head. Naruto shrugged. Dunno. They walked out the door. Naruto blinked furiously, and the world slowly slid back to normal. He grinned enthusiastically up at Karasu. Fit as a fiddle, Dadabeo. Karasu sighed. Please don't say Dadabeo. He deadpanned, standing back up. Come on, I'll shunshin you home. I'm in a hurry right now. It was raining hard. Naruto ran quickly through the deserted street. There was a quiet fear in the back of his mind, he really didn't want to repeat of what happened that night. That, and Karasu has told him multiple times not to go out during the night when he was off duty. Hey, it wasn't his fault he fell asleep training alone on the other side of the village. Okay maybe it was. Running down the street, his soaked to the bone and lost in his thoughts, he was too distracted to notice it until it was too late. The aura clawed at Naruto's mind like a chainsaw. The sense of an overwhelming despair and the confusing conflicts of emotion sent Naruto staggering to the ground, his head reeling with the overload. Through his hazy vision, he saw sandals walking towards him in the rain before stopping in front of his face. Are you alright? Said an unfamiliar voice. Naruto looked up into the dark emotionless eyes of Echeha, the long sable bangs, dripping from the rain, hanging over his eyes. He and Naruto answered sarcastically, although a large grin plastered itself on his face. He staggered upright to his feet and nearly fell over again if it weren't for the stiff hand clasping itself on his shoulder. Thanks, Mr. Um. Naruto exclaimed, a bit surprised by the stranger's kindness. The young man tilted his head a little to the side as if contemplating the question. There was silence for a brief second before he answered. Ichiha Tachi. The guard tilted his head a little to the side as if contemplating the question. There was silence for a brief second before he answered. Karasu. Naruto was startled. He opened his mouth to say something but closed it again, making him look like a gaping fish. Itachi watched Naruto in silence before blinking once and walking off, leaving the speechless boy in the rain. Karasu dug into his pocket and came up with a tiny red present. Early birthday present, he murmured as he handed it to a surprised Naruto. Why aren't you going to be there? Naruto shot back, his eyes staring at Karasu suspiciously. Karasu's aura darkened quickly, although he didn't betray his expression. You're in the academy, and soon, you won't need a bodyguard anymore. I won't be here 24-7 forever. And, with one quick nod, Karasu disappeared in another whirl of leaves. Aino nearly lost his grip as Naruto suddenly ran in the opposite direction of his apartment. Boy. What are you doing? Kano glowered at Naruto as the two ran past the training grounds they were previously in. Where are we going? Karasu's going to do something stupid. Naruto replied in a slightly panicked voice. We have to go talk to him, just to make to sure he doesn't leave or anything. If Kano was confused, he didn't show it. 
He nodded once before leaping off Naruto's back, running side by side next to Naruto. The red-tinted moon was high in the sky by the time they reached the Ichiha district. Sure enough, there appeared to be something off with the place. There were no guards on the entrances, and the place was a ghost town, completely silent without any evidence of life. The two walked quickly through the deserted street, and Naruto was tense, his guard up fully. Warning signs were flashing off in his head. When they turned the corner, Naruto froze completely. There were bodies everywhere, lying stretched out on the ground, their faces permanently contorted into an expression of shock and terror. Naruto gagged at the stench of blood thick in the air, barely hearing Kano swear profusely under his breath. The worst part were the eyes. Or the lack of eyes. Every single body had their eyeballs completely ripped out of their sockets, leaving gaping sockets and blood running down like tears. Itachi Naruto breathed, walking forward. He felt a sudden tug on his arm and glanced backwards. Kano was gripping his arm, and there was a desperate expression on his face. It's dangerous. Kano whispered, although both of them knew it was no use. I have to make sure he's okay, Naruto shot back, trying to tug free his arm. My hero complexion, remember? He added lightly. Slowly, Kano let go of his arm and was about to follow Naruto, but he stopped him. I'm not going to be in danger. I'll just check things out. Naruto said reassuringly. I need you to go to the Hokage Tower, tell Oji-san what's happening. There was a savage glint in Kano's eye and he opened his mouth, but Naruto beat him to it. You're faster than me, Naruto stated, a determined expression on his face. Kano slowly looked down on the ground, his face hidden by the cap. Suddenly, he looked up. You know what? Fuck you, he growled, before turning away and running off. Naruto watched him leave with a heavy heart. Naruto's eyes turned a deep red, the pupils elongating into a three-pointed star before he closed his eyes. This was a trick Kano had taught him after experimenting with his bloodline. Naruto's eyes searched through the district, sensing for auras. The Kurabarigan, when used in this form, could see auras a few kilometers away, and although not as ranged as a Byakugan, it had the plus of sensing emotion and not chakra. Meaning while people could disguise their chakra, they couldn't disguise their emotion. It was something like finding a scent. Or at least, that's what Kino said. Naruto snapped open his eyes. There was a person alive a few houses away. Compassing himself and ignoring the dead bodies, Naruto raced through the abandoned street. His heart was beating faster and faster by the time he reached the house. The door was blown wide open, like as if somebody had shoved it open. He entered it tentatively, searching for the aura. It was weak and small possibly Sasuke's. Naruto entered the living room and gagged. The middle-aged man was slouched against the wall in the corner, the kunai embedded in his head had cracked open his skull and looked fresh. The killer had been here quite recently. In the middle of the room was another middle-aged woman, possibly his wife, a large slash on her back. Naruto held his breath. The woman was shielding something with her body. He approached the corpse and gently moved it to the side. His eyes widened. It was a girl, around four years old. Her long blue-black hair was strewn around her body and her breath was labored. There was a small stab wound directly on her chest, the blood leaking onto her pink and blue kimono. She stared up at Naruto, her cold black eyes pleading and silently crying. Naruto stayed silent, staring at the girl before crouching down. What happened? Naruto asked softly. The girl opened her mouth to say something, but choked up blood. Eyes furrowing in the effort, she tried again. Ha! Ah. Sent stranger. Suddenly, four kunai came out of nowhere, and, on instinct, Naruto jumped away, watching in horror as the kunai embedded themselves into the girl. She gave a shaking breath before falling limp. What do we have here, now? Drawled a voice from the door. Naruto's breath got caught in his throat, and he stared at the man walking casually into the room. He was wearing all black, and the moonlight outside illuminated the orange mask he wore, a twirling spiral centering on one eye hole. Without realizing it, Naruto was slowly backing away from the man as he came closer. The masked man cocked his head towards Naruto. Oh, the Jinchuriki. Madara is surprised you're here. As he spoke, he began slowly unsheathing the katana on his back, walking calmly towards him. Sweat dripped down Naruto's face, and he quickly threw a smoke bomb at him. The man quickly sliced through it, but the smoke exploded anyway, enveloping the room in a dark cloud. Madara coughed loudly, blowing away the smoke with one hand. When it cleared, Naruto was nowhere to be seen. Oh, Naruto-san. He whined. Come back. Toby is a good boy, he won't hurt you. Outside, Naruto was running hard, his breath labored as he ran. There was no question. That masked man had killed the entire Ichiha clan including Itachi and Sasuke. And. He was going to kill him. Naruto hid in a clothing shop, trying to calm his heartbeat down. Kano, where are you? He thought desperately. Oh 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 I I I. Naruto-san. Madara yelled out, his hand cupped over where his mouth should be. He walked casually through the street, nonchalantly kicking dead bodies as he walked. 
Naruto watched, frozen, as he walked past where he was hiding. He held his breath as Madara paused, looking in his general direction, before shrugging and continuing down the street. When Madara disappeared from the corner of the street, Naruto let out a relieved sigh. Hello, Naruto-san, whispered a voice in his ear. Naruto jumped visibly before large hands pinned Naruto against the wall, and he found himself looking straight into the man's mask. Beneath the mask was a single red eye, black tear-shaped dot spinning around the pupil, a Sharingan. Naruto screwed his eyes shut, not wanting to be caught in a Jinjutsu. He tensed as he heard the familiar sound of a katana being unsheathed again and felt the metal pressing against his neck. Your heart is beating really fast, Naruto-san, Madara exclaimed quietly, the eye crinkling into an upside-down U-shape. Naruto growled, snapping his eyes open. Madara stared at his eyes in surprise but backflipped quickly, just as a flurry of blades flew upwards where his head was. His eyes widened slightly as his orange mask was sliced clean in half. Naruto snarled, the three-pointed cross in his eyes spinning rapidly and becoming narrower and narrower, until turning into red slits. The whiskers thickened and his appearance became more feral. Madara jumped upwards just as a gust of wind blew underneath him, flying past him and crashing into the nearby buildings. Just as his feet touched the ground, he was assaulted by a large red chakra tail, which slammed him into the ground, creating a large crater. Naruto jumped high into the air, before landing cat-like in front of the crater, his slitted eyes darting in the stirred-up dust. As the debris cleared, the moonlight slowly revealed. A log. What an interesting bloodline, Jinchuriki. Spoke a voice behind him. With lightning-fast speed, Naruto's chakra tail whipped out from behind him as he whirled around, facing a laughing Madara. His hair was short and spiky, similar to Naruto's, and long black bangs partially covered his left eye, which had a black eye patch over it. There was a creepy smile playing on his lips, and it looked out of place on the seemingly gentle-looking face. Ichiha Madara, Naruto snarled, his voice deeper and more menacing. As he spoke, the red chakra enveloped him, forming another chakra tail. Madara smirked, before disappearing completely. Suddenly, there was a burning pain in his stomach, and Naruto looked down. There was a long katana sticking out of his chest. At first, the sight didn't register in his mind, but soon, black spots filled his eyes, and the slits faded away, leaving clear blue eyes. Team Naruto faltered before collapsing on the ground, unconscious. Madara contemplated the unconscious form on the ground before walking over to it. He reached out his hand, but another gloved hand came out of nowhere, gripping the arm in a bruising hold. Oh. Hello, Yellow San. Madara said casually, turning his head towards the person. Like Madara, he was wearing all black and carried a guitar slung across his back. His breathing was slightly labored, and his hood had come off, revealing a blank anbu mask with slit holes for eyes, and long blonde hair tied into a messy ponytail at the back. Equally long and unruly blonde bangs fell into his eyes. Yellow San didn't bother to reply, and as the two continued to stare at each other, a sharp whistle rang through the silence. Long dark blurs were seen running towards the two. The anbu are here, Yellow San stated, his voice deep and menacing under the mask. He slowly let go of his arm. Madara stared unnervingly at the man before reaching into his pocket, pulling out another orange mask, which he quickly donned on. Itachi, Madara whispered loudly. A dark blur came seconds later from the rooftops, landing next to Madara. Itachi, clad in his anbu armor, glanced at the two men before his eyes landed on the unconscious form of Naruto. He gave an accusing glance at Madara who waved it off. The two ran off, but Itachi gave one glance at the blonde man who was staring back at him. They both shared a look before turning their heads away. Yellow San sighed, the action sounding like a rattling noise under the mask. He crouched down near Naruto, inspecting the stab wound. It had already scabbed over, and skin was slowly healing over it. He would be okay. As he stood up, four Anbu came down from the rooftops, kunai knives aimed threateningly at him. The Kami Taichu, we have spotted and apprehended a possible suspect, whispered Cat into a microphone on her ear. State your name, the one from the left demanded, wearing a bear mask. The others shifted slightly, nervously scrutinizing the stranger. It was common knowledge that there weren't many blonde people in Kanoha. Especially ones with yellow that had a brightness that rivaled the sun. In fact, the only people with bright blonde hair was the late fourth Hokage and the Jinchuriki himself. Yet, here was a stranger with the same blonde hair and wearing no hit I ate. Me? Yellow Sant said, pointing to himself. Oh well oh. Hokage-sama. He exclaimed suddenly, bowing down to a person behind Bear. The four Anbu simultaneously glanced behind Bear, and before they could react, the stranger disappeared in a whirl of leaves. Oh crap. Cat sighed in her mask. Just then, an older man came in to join the four. He was wearing the typical Anbu armor, except his armor was embroidered with golden threads. The Anbu tattoo on his left shoulder was also outlined in gold. Unruly, spiky, silver hair, leaning towards the left, poked out from the mask, which was painted in the form of a wolf. Where is the target? The Kami asked, looking directly at Bear. 
The four shifted nervously under his stern gaze. Well, we, uh, Yamato, you're Anbu. Speak clearly, Akami barked out, although his voice sounded slightly amused. Yes, Taichu. Yamato said stiffly, before bowing low. Cat, Bear, Lion and I were apprehending the target when he distracted us, Taichu. Taking the chance, he disappeared. That is all, Akami Taichu. Akami digested the information quickly before launching into a series of hand seals. Biting his finger, he slammed the hand onto the floor, releasing intricate marks on the ground. In a puff of smoke, a pack of dogs appeared, all of different sizes and breeds. One at the front, a small pug, wrinkled his nose in disgust. Bew. Packin complained shortly, giving Akami a reproachful look. Akami ignored him. Okay. Team A, see if you can find the scent of any people alive. The Anbu team will help you. Team B, locate the scent of the suspect or suspects. Go. Both Dog and Anbu nodded briskly as one team ran off in all directions, while the other stayed here, walking cautiously around the street. Akami hissed quietly as his attention was finally focused on the unconscious form of Naruto. Kuzo? Naruto what the hell are you doing here? He murmured to himself, shifting the boy onto his back. The rest of you, continue looking. Pakin, notify me once you find something. Akami ran off towards the Kanoha hospital, jumping from roof to roof. The bee continued. I hope you enjoyed. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.